will be followed by a moment of silence. Uh, please stand with me, and we will be led today by Supervisor Shucklin. Thank you. Please join me in saluting our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Item number one on today's agenda is Board of Supervisors Matters, and I will begin today with Supervisor Townsend. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a couple of things to report today. Um, on the 5th, we had our local area formation commission meeting with uh, uh, Chair Vanderpool and I, and there were very few things on the agenda, but one was the Sequoia Gateway uh, project and we approved the extraterritorial service agreement for with the city of Isaiah for the sewer extension. Uh, so just another step in that process. And then uh, on the same day, had a meeting with our chief of staff and our board reps just to sort of strategize how to do town halls this year, uh, trying to get some in uh, toward the end of the year and uh, whether or not that's going to we're going to be able to do it. And if we can't do an in person, what can we do? So we're working on that right now. And uh, on the 6th, had our Eastern Thule Groundwater Sustainability Agency meeting. And um, I think I said before, but it's, it's getting more and more real as we voted to pass uh, the rules and regulations uh, for uh, the GSA uh, on this last meeting. And with the anticipation that we'll probably still be making some more amendments to it once it gets through a couple of more uh, committees and we'll receive a little bit more comment, but the comments have, have obviously been pouring in on uh, how to make adjustments and some of those have been taken into account already and others will be added uh, at next month's meeting. And then this whole week, just been making a lot of calls and uh, emails regarding the small business grants uh, that we had approved and uh, that they're, uh, the applications are up and live right now. And so take building a few questions, but mostly trying to get the word out and make sure everybody knows that those are available. And most people, uh, if they haven't heard about it, were pleasantly surprised uh, to hear about it. So hopefully we'll be able to get a lot of that distributed to help those businesses out. And today I'm going to uh, have a meeting uh, later on this afternoon with the Salt and Light Works uh, just to uh, get to know that group a little bit and discuss uh, the homeless situation in Tulare County and some ideas, kind of hear from them on their vision and how that might uh, be able to mesh with ours. Uh, and on the 12th, have a uh, tribal trust and casino ad hoc meeting. And uh, the, the governor just signed the, uh, uh, the compact uh, with a few of the tribes, including the Tule River uh, tribe for their casino this last week. So another step in that uh, process. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll discuss how that's going as well. And then on the 13th, the San Joaquin Valley Regional Policy Council uh, meeting, and we will be discussing again how to do the uh, the Valley Voice uh, trip to D.C. Since it won't be a trip, it'll be a uh, it'll be a, a Zoom type meeting, and so we'll be discussing the uh, policies uh, that will be included in that discussion. And that's about it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll now move on to Supervisor Valero. All right. Good morning, Tulare County. Last week's Seville Water Awareness Campaign and ribbon cutting was a success. I want to thank our Board of Supervisors staff for realizing this vision, uh, to Ross Miller and his team for getting the site ready for presentation, to our State Senator Melissa Hurtado and Seville Yedem CSD President Linda Gutierrez for attending and sharing a few words. Linda has been in the trenches day in and day out, along with Becky Quintana, our community leader and longstanding advocate. To the State Water Board for attending as well, and of course, your monetary assistance, and agencies like Self-Help Enterprise, Community Water Center, and Citizens for a Better Seville for initiating this change and this need. I am so happy that the county was able to fill the gap with this encounter, especially after so many years. 
Last Friday, I participated in the 2020 Farm Worker Conference Planning Committee. Evidently, the conference will look a lot different this year. We are working diligently to find a safe way to share very important information with the focus on farm worker safety, COVID-19 related topics, encouraging families not to congregate, and sharing messages of hope and to care for one another during these difficult times. Last Friday, I also had the opportunity to deliver food to the Badger community. It's always great to reconnect with the Badger leaders who have worked out a system for food and resource distribution out of the new Sequoia Community Center. Although it takes me about three hours round trip in a day, um, I still really enjoy that trek up to our mountain community. I appreciate them, them and their efforts to keep resources moving through this time. Yesterday, I toured the Dinuba United Health Center's campus. It's officially, it officially opened as of yesterday. I, along with the Dinuba Chamber and Congressman Nunez's office, were present for our guided tour. It is an awesome facility with urgent care needs as well. And given the lack of urgent care services in Dinuba, this was one of the stipulations prior to making its footprint in the city. So great facility with great services all in one place. Yesterday, I tuned in to the Woodlake City Council meeting. The city of Woodlake made an offer for approximately 55.5 acres of olives west of the city. And so this purchase will promote future economic housing, parks, and recreation development. Over the last few years, the city has acquired properties and marketed them to potential developers or develop them. And as a result, we've seen the city of Woodlake grow greatly over the past few years. This has previously been done with properties that led to projects like the Woodlake Community Center, the Woodlake Transit Center, AutoZone, Woodlake Gas Station, Hillside Estates, Woodlake Concord and the Seven Points expansion. Although this is outside of city limits, it will now go to LAFCO for potential annexation. And so I'm looking forward to tomorrow's filming at the Dinuba Library, where we will show families what book drop-off and pickup looks like. Now, more than ever, we need to really work hard at diminishing learning loss and push our youth to continue reading and writing during this time. I'll also be speaking at the Tulare King's Hispanic Chamber Ambassador Luncheon via Zoom, and then participating in one last small business grant support session for those who may still have questions about our grant giving opportunity. And that will take place tomorrow at 1.30 on Zoom and geared towards uh, District 4 businesses. Um, and then on Thursday, I have a board meeting with our McKellar Farms Outdoor Education Initiative. And then lastly, I just want to thank our sheriff uh, for today's outreach in the community of, Lo of London, and I hope to be attending that from 5 to 7 tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Supervisor. Next up, I'll have Supervisor Shucklin and maybe talk a little bit about the uh, groundbreaking and uh, or the ribbon cutting in Seville Yetum uh, since the State Water Board and all kinds of other county officials were invited. Go ahead. You've been on the board since that, that whole thing started, so uh, you had a quite a bit of involvement in that, so thank you to you also. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I just, uh, I think it's, it's important that we make sure we involve all the board members that are a part of the decisions that affect uh, the uh, various communities in our county, so go ahead, Supervisor. Okay, thank you. Um, last week I had my uh, mental health board meeting via Zoom, of course. Uh, filled a lot of calls again for small business grants and COVID related items. Um, I did have the opportunity to take a few days off and go to uh, beautiful Yosemite National Park, one of you know, the great parks that we have in our own backyard. So um, it was kind of nice. They are limiting the amount of people that are in the park right now. So that made it even nicer. Um, yesterday, I had a health advisory committee meeting, which was uh, quite, a, we had a, quite an extensive presentation um, about the street medicine program that HHSA is partnering with uh, the Kings Tulare Homeless Alliance and Cahuilla Delta, and they go out and provide medical services to our homeless population. 
Um, it's really cut down quite a bit, I understand, on emergency room visits. Um, they've also made some really good connections with p folks when you go out there and, and provide care, whether it's you know, a Band-Aid or Neosporin or they're going out and you know, draining abscesses and providing antibiotics, uh, you start to build some trust and rapport and I think that's a, a big deal in uh, dealing with, with the homeless and helping to get them um, independent and situated. We also had an a update on COVID-19. We had um, Dr. Sharon Minnick, our epidemiologist, gave a very extensive uh, numbers report. Um, Stacy Chastain talked to us about our contact tracing, and uh, you know that's when, and we're finding out that I think 43% of those that have been contacted that currently have a COVID got so through social gatherings. Uh, so we need to to remember to careful with our social gatherings. And then Denise Lopez, our lab manager, who uh, our lab has been rocking it. Uh, I think they're up to 2,000 um, tests a week, which I think when we first started, it might might have been a, a couple of hundred. And not only are they doing that amount, they're also doing it within with results within 24 hours. So again, a shout out to um, our lab. That's it. All right, Supervisor Crocker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, last week on uh, Thursday, I'll highlight a, a few meetings. Um, one, the uh, California Public Utilities Commission held uh, their normal meeting, and one of the topics of discussion was um, a proposed rate to uh, decouple uh, rates from the amount of um, water that's used for water utilities in particular. Um, that's within the PUC's jurisdiction. And um, so I spoke in opposition to that. And the, the, the main concern is that um, what that would do is not only would it uh, potentially increase rates um, for a county that um, really we already know that, that things are tough and we have median household income that's um, you know, in the low $30,000 range um, but that's, it's, the timing's bad, but it also encourages more water use. Um, and as we're going through Sigma, um, as we're trying to um, get some large water infrastructure projects built, um, that things that haven't been built in over 40 years, um, I think that's uh, a wrong message to send um, to encourage individuals to use more water um, in order to uh, pay for some of the um, needed infrastructure upgrades. Um, I know that the uh, commission decided to postpone their decision, and um, I know there were several others um, also speaking out against that from throughout the state, so hopefully um, that won't happen. I know Cal Water in particular, that would have an impact for folks in Visalia, um, I'm not, and I think there's a few other, um, few other uh, PUC entities that uh, probably in the Springville area that have uh, Del Oro and some others that would be impacted by that. Um, also on Thursday, uh, I had the opportunity to see um, Dr. Beth Cardwell Grafton, who is recently retired from the Lynn Cove Field Station, the University of California Cooperative Extension Field Station, and um, and I, I I wanted to meet with her and provide her with um, an award that. Uh, that staff helped me create a few years ago um, that we called the Good Samaritan Award. And we were able to give that out initially to uh, Josue Topete um, of Plainview uh, when he uh, helped save the life of a neighbor um, when she was in distress. And, um, and even though that uh, Dr. Beth, she may not have saved a life directly, um, her research that she's done has helped implement strategies that have kept um, Asian citrus psyllid and Wang Long being away from Tulare County um, and really uh, made some significant strides and um, the whole theory was to put policies in place to help delay the spread of the of the disease and until we could figure out a way or the scientists could figure out a way to um, to have some type of cure and it looks like we're almost to that point. There's some very promising things that have happened. Um, there's some rootstocks that look like they may be um, 
that they may uh, be able to be resistant to this. And this is a disease, again, that's um, wiped out 70% of Florida's citrus industry. So um, it's very devastating. And for the 134,000 plus acres that we have of citrus that we have in Tulare County, um, it's crucial that we find something. So I, um, again, I think it goes to that point of, you know, uh, I couldn't agree more with what uh, Supervisor Shuckley said about our public health lab officials. You know, it's so often that um, the people that are working behind the scenes um, don't get credit and um, for, um, for our public health officials and for uh, Dr. Cardwell Grafton and the team out at Lynn Cove, um, they just do phenomenal work, even though in their own respective separate fields. Um, also that uh, last Thursday evening, I uh, was able to speak with the Exeter Republican Women Federated Group and, um, and really the emphasis was promoting uh, small business grants. And so I hope that there were several individuals that were writing um, notes down and asked for where, the, uh, where they could find more information, whether or not they qualified. So I hope that that spurs um, some more applications or did spur some applications. Um, th upcoming this week, um, tomorrow I have an RCRC uh, board meeting. Um, we'll be taking up uh, positions and discussing whether or, not, or whether or not to take up positions on several statewide ballot initiatives. I won't go into the details of each of those, but it, uh, we're talking about Proposition 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 briefly. Um, Prop 15 is a split roll initiative that will uh, roll back uh, significant portions of Proposition 13 uh, on property taxes. Proposition 16 is a repeal of Prop 209 from 1996, which, uh, which abolished uh, affirmative action. Um, so it's looking to reinstall affirmative action in the state. Uh, Prop 17 is giving voting rights to convicted felons. Uh, that's a good idea, not. Um, and uh, Proposition 18 is um, lowering the voting age to 17 for local um, elections and non-federal elections, so primaries as well and some other things. Um, and Prop 19 is a bit complicated, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, and I also will be attending the tribal meeting. NACO uh, tomorrow also has a public lands committee that I'll be attending. And uh, Monday, uh, we have a TCAG and our first transit JPA meeting. All right, thank you, Supervisor. A couple things I wanted to go over. I uh, actually wanted to thank uh, county staff and uh, various partners in the Community Care Coalition uh, for their outreach efforts in uh, the community of Allensworth. They had an event uh, uh, yesterday evening um, and actually were able to hand out 110 boxes of household supplies. Um, they also handed out over 100 backpacks. Uh, they collected uh, uh, various uh, specimens, did testing, did a lot of work out there uh, that was COVID related. Um, and I just appreciate the, uh, the work and effort that they put in. And that was a pilot project that worked very well uh, in Allensworth, and next they will be moving on to the community of Early Martin. I just want to uh, say thank you to that group and all the partners uh, and community organizations involved in that organization to help make that happen. Um, yesterday there was a meeting of the Greater Korea Groundwater Sustainability Agency. Um, they did talk about the Prop 218 uh, process that will be uh, undertaken here very soon. Um, it was supposed to uh, be ready to hit the tax rolls this year, but uh, due to the COVID-19 situation that has been postponed. Um, and as a little heads up to uh, landowners in the greater Cahuilla, uh, those per acre fees uh, once implemented or voted upon by voters range from uh, five to uh, $15 per acre per year uh, for groundwater sustainability uh, planning uh, and implementation going forward. So um, the fees change on an annual basis, uh, but appear to be increasing as the plan is uh, further implemented. Um, but uh, from a county perspective, that means that the county will be reimbursed by landowners uh, and other uh, financial partners, uh, such as irrigation districts, within the uh, Greater Cahuilla uh, for the cost that they have fronted on behalf of the organization in the plan process. Um, also yesterday had a, uh, a Tulare Chamber of Commerce Governmental Affairs Committee meeting, thought that went very well. 
I was contacted last week by the uh, Tulare City Manager, and it was again reiterated yesterday by the Mayor of Tulare. Uh, there is a request from the city that the county uh, board of supervisors match the federal government's allocation of uh, CARES Act funding, which the city of Tulare received uh, approximately 870,000, uh, give or take, and um, uh, the city has requested that the county from its $48 million allocation of CARES Act funding match dollar for dollar the city of Tulare's uh, funding that they received from the CARES Act. And so uh, just as a heads up to my colleagues uh, that represent various cities, that same request may be coming, um, but uh, that would very much affect the county's uh, spending plan and the allocation of funds that we have made towards the various categories which are intended to benefit not just unincorporated area residents, but in fact benefit all of Tulare County, including our uh, incorporated cities. So um, it was mentioned yesterday that that request is coming from the city of Tulare and that would be a great help in filling their budget deficit this year. And my understanding is, is that's not an allowable use of CARES Act funding, but the request was still made. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, please. Is that in addition to the small business grants that we're infusing into the cities and rent and utility assistance and whatnot? It, it is. So the, um, uh, just the small business grant program that we are uh, undertaking uh, allocates one and a half million dollars after our uh, board meeting and amendment of the original plan proposed to us. Uh, it allocates one and a half million dollars to each district for uh, businesses in that district to benefit from um, should they have a need. Um, and uh, I'm assuming that uh, we'll hear a little bit later about that, seeing Adam Peck in the audience. Um, this evening I will be presenting uh, at the Tulare Chamber Youth Leadership Classes uh, City County Day uh, presentation. I will be doing that uh, via Zoom this evening. Um, tomorrow morning at 7.30, the uh, Early Mart Rotary Club is sponsoring a groundbreaking for the Early Mart Baseball Park a rehabilitation and uh, just huge project that they're undertaking there as a community benefit. Um, that is a very much used amenity in the community and has needed some uh, upgrades over the years and I appreciate the Early Mart Rotary Club uh, rising to the occasion to meet that need um, and that ribbon cutting will take place tomorrow at 7.30. There will be a Tulare County Employees Retirement Association board meeting tomorrow at 8.30 in Visalia. Um, that will be followed by a Tulare County Employees Retirement Association Investment Committee meeting tomorrow at 10.30. Um, and then on Thursday at 2.30, uh, I believe uh, Supervisor Shuckley and myself will be attending the state tri strike team uh, meeting uh, where they will be talking about their targeted efforts here in Tulare County. Uh, regarding slowing the spread of COVID-19 and uh, what resources the state can bring to help uh, Tulare County in our efforts and uh, also help to uh, meet some of the needs that we have here uh, locally in our unique community. Um, lastly, I will uh, make mention again, like Supervisor Crocker, we do have a uh, Tulare County Association of Governments meeting uh, Monday, August 17th at one o'clock right here in these board chambers. Um, that concludes uh, Board of Supervisors matters. Um, I will now uh, move on on our agenda and before I take up item number two, I have a request by our fiscally responsible county administrative officer since we pay by the minute for these individuals to move up item 26 from uh, untimed portion of our meeting and take that up uh, right now um, so that we can save our county some much needed dollars. Is that correct? Mr. CAO. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. <laughs> Appreciate that flexibility in the, in the agenda today. Uh, this is our annual um, report on the Millennium Fund program that has been established since 1999 for the County of Tulare. And um, um, because of the COVID times, our um, managing director of the fund, Lauren Bryant, uh, will be presenting via Zoom today. So without further ado, it is my um, pleasure to introduce Lauren Bryant from the PFM um, Asset Management Company, and she will um, walk us through the fund's performance for the last year. Lauren? Yes, thank you, Mr. Britt, and good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to present PFM's annual report for the county's Millennium Fund program. 
Um, as the program's administrator and investment advisor, PSM prepares an annual report summarizing the program's performance and provides details about por the portfolio strategy for the period ended April 1st. That's the official program year. Uh, this presentation is a summary of the full report that is included in your agenda packet. Um, as a refresher, the, the Millennium Fund program is the name of the taxable variable rate demand bond issued by the county back in uh, 1999. The, the bonds are secured by certain lease payments and the county share of the National Tobacco Settlement. Uh, the settlement payments are received by the county on an annual basis. Uh, the total amount of the bonds that were issued back in 1999 was $45 million. Uh, with the purpose of uh, the county uh, issued the bonds initially to create an endowment to fund public capital improvements. Um, in 2006, the county refunded the original issue with a private placement. At the time, that was with DEPFA Bank. Uh, that has now been uh, transferred over to SMS Work Management Company. Um, the private placement resulted in significant savings for the county and actually helped to isolate the program from the 2008-2009 financial crisis. The current borrowing rate, as you see, is one month LIBOR plus 0.25%. Uh, so just for some context, as of July 1st, given the interest rates are significantly uh, lower than where they have been at the start of the year, which I'll get into, that borrowing rate was 0.42%. Um, at the outset of the, of the issuance of the bonds, uh, the program had uh, established several long-term investment objectives. And I'll go into these in more detail uh, on the next few pages, but I'll just summarize them here. The first one was to achieve and maintain parity. The, the second one was to carefully control risk to ensure the ongoing success of the program. And the third and final, but certainly not the least important, was to, to generate an investment return higher than the barn rate on the program so that you could grow the fund over time and provide annual appro appropriations uh, to the county. So on this page, uh, what we're looking at is the uh, market value of the Millennium Fund program. So as of April 1st of 2020, the total value of the program was 55.8 million. Um, the program comprises three different accounts. The Millennium Fund is considered the endowment. So uh, additional uh, tobacco settlement payments over and above what it needed to pay debt service and administrative costs goes into the Millennium Fund, and that becomes the endowment, which grows over time. The Bond Fund is a fund that was established to cover debt service and other administrative costs for the upcoming year. And the Tobacco Settlement Fund, that usually stays close to zero. It's $2 as of April 1st, because this is the fund that receives the annual tobacco settlement payment. And so after the date of this report, on May 27th, the county received its annual tobacco payment of $4.35 million. A few program highlights. Again, uh, a reminder for the year ended April 1st, which is a different fiscal year than the county has, uh, but this is because of when the bonds were issued. The program value continues, the market value continues to create, increase year over year, and I'll uh, get into some of these details on uh, subsequent pages. Uh, for 2019, the county withdrew the maximum amount of $3.5 million for capital expenditures. Uh, the county paid down about $1.2 million in principal, which lowered that outstanding par amount uh, for the program. And the uh, earnings rate, the cumulative earnings rate since inception continues to outpace the borrowing rate uh, to the tune of a 30 basis points or 0.3%. Um, and the program value, uh, what we call the unwind value, which I have a, a, a graph on um, in a, a couple of slides, uh, the program value exceeds the outstanding par by $24.7 million. Uh, and so that just means if the program was to be unwound today, um, there would not need to be any uh, additional resources from the county to help unwind the program. Um, annually, the county has the option to withdraw the lesser of three and a half million or the amount by which the market value exceeds the outstanding par of the bonds. So to date, the county has withdrawn $56.7 million and is eligible to withdraw another three and a half million dollars in 2020, if it so chooses. 
as I mentioned on a prior page, when we talk about unwind position, one of the program's primary objectives is to achieve and maintain parity. So this is when the market value of the program is equal to or greater than the outstanding par of the bond. Uh, portions of the principal get paid down every year. Uh, so when the market value is greater, the county can unwind the program without using resources of the county. So as of April 1st, uh, the unwind position was very favorable at $24.7 million. So the market value was 55.8. The amount of bonds outstanding was 31.1. The original uh, issuance, as you might recall, is $45 million of bonds. So you have an unwind position of $24.7 million, which is an increase of $1.3 million over 2019. So the market value increased. And then at the same time, the amount of bonds paid down uh, was, was increased as well. So you lowered the amount of bonds outstanding. I'm going to turn a little bit to the market environment, which um, <laughs> has been quite a roller coaster ride since we last uh, uh, spoke about the program in August of 2019. Um, so during 2019 and the first two months of 2020, markets were relatively calm and the economy is growing at a fairly moderate pace. Uh, in other words, we were in a pretty stable environment. Uh, then, of course, came the emergence of COVID-19, the pandemic, which upended economies around the globe as businesses were forced to close their doors. Um, this sent equity markets uh, into a tailspin. And uh, what investors tend to do when that happens is they flee to the safe haven of U.S. government securities like U.S. Treasuries, which I'm showing on this page here. Um, so as demand for uh, U.S. Treasuries increased, their prices increased as well and interest rates fell because um, there's an inverse relationship between price and yields for fixed income securities. There was a significant decline. Uh, the significant decline is depicted here in this graph. Um, so the U.S. Treasury yield curve on the left-hand side, the yellow line um, shows the yields of U.S. Treasury with maturities ranging from three months to five years at one point in time of March 31st, 2019, shown in yellow, and yields on U.S. Treasuries for the same maturity range uh, for uh, uh, as of March 31st, 2020, shown in blue. Um, so you can see uh, across the yield curve, is what, is what we call it, the yield curve, across maturities, interest rates fell dramatically. That's also shown in the table on the right-hand side. So for three months, um, maturities all the way up to five years, it was close to, it was an average of 2% decline in interest rates for that period. And actually, uh, much of that happened in just a one-month time frame. Because at the outset of the pandemic, the Federal Reserve acted quickly and lowered the Fed funds target rate, which is that uh, uh, near that zero to three to six month uh, area impacts the three to six month area of the yield curve, back to levels we witnessed during the 08 or 09 financial crisis, which is close to 0%. So how did that impact the portfolio strategy for the Millennium Fund program? Well, um, we uh, first and foremost, we seek to purchase only high quality investments uh, for the program, and of course, to be consistent with the objective of generating a return higher than the borrowing rate, we seek those investments that have a yield that, that is above the borrowing rate and also trying to mitigate some interest rate risk. The table at the bottom of this page shows uh, the portfolio holdings that we have purchased as of March 31st relative to current interest rates for the, for the last year. So a lot of high quality U.S. Treasuries, federal agency securities, and high quality corporate notes. In recent years, when rates were, interest rates were rising, uh, PFM found significant value in floating rate securities, as, a, as you might recall. Um, and this is when uh, we, the yield on a security would move up in tandem with market rates. Well, this trend reversed itself in 2019 when rates began to move lower. Um, so we started to shift the focus even back in 2019 and concentrate more on fixed rate securities. So these securities, their yield doesn't change even as rates move lower. And this strategy paid off uh, significantly as interest rates fell in early 2020. On this page, you can see the evolution of the composition of the portfolio over the last six years. So essentially what you're seeing is the change in um, sectors um, over the period of time as interest rates and other uh, economic fundamentals have changed. So here you can see it in March 2020, an increase in the amount of fixed rate corporate notes that we added to the portfolio, a decrease in the number of floating rate corporate notes, 
and also an increase in the uh, number of federal agencies which offered additional value during this time period as well. So we adapted quickly to the interest rate environment, which um, helped with performance of the portfolio, which I will get into on the next page. So the program continues to achieve its third objective of generating a return that is in excess of the borrowing rate since inception, that positive spread or um, uh, difference in yield between the return and the borrowing rate is 0.3%. Um, so that is favorable and, and continues to help grow the market value of the endowment, also known as the Millennium Fund. I'm going to take a, since that was back in April, I wanted to give you a, a more current look at the portfolio. This is as of June 30th. And this is just for the Millennium Fund portfolio, it does not include the um, tobacco settlement uh, fund or the bond fund. Um, the market value of the Millennium Fund is 58.6 million. If we included the um, TSR and the bond fund, that would be closer to $60.9 million because there has been some market value increase, but also this includes the $4 million tobacco uh, settlement receipt back in May. Um, the average maturity of the portfolio is a little over two and a half years. Um, it's a very high credit quality portfolio. You can see um, the AA represents uh, the, the uh, credit rating of U.S. Treasury securities and federal agency securities uh, by Standard & Poor's. Um, all other rating agencies, Fitch and Moody's, for example, um, have a rating for federal agencies and uh, U.S. Treasuries of AAA, but we are more conservative when we take a look at, um, at the program. Um, all investments are compliant with the program's indenture, which is the bond documents um, that outline the permitted investments and maturity limits for the Millennium Fund program. Here is a look at the maturity distribution from zero months all the way out to about five years. What really has changed in recent years, especially the last 18 months, is the amount of non-floating or fixed rate securities that we have in the portfolio versus just 15% of floating rate securities. Um, for those that have been a part of the, the board for the last three to four years would note that um, this has flip-flopped, if you will. We had a significant amount of floating rate securities uh, back in 2017, 2018, probably a reversal of the trend, as we mentioned, because of the, um, the, the declining interest rates in 2019 and into 2020. And then in, in summary here, um, we just want to give a little bit of an outlook uh, for what we're seeing here for the remainder of the year. Um, we are well into, of course, 2020 and into this next program year. Um, and in our view, the economy is still expected to struggle a bit, even as states reopen as a result of the pandemic. We saw second quarter uh, GDP or gross domestic product of minus 33%. So gross domestic product is the value of all the goods and services produced in the U.S., and that was a significant decline um, from prior periods. Um, somewhat of the silver lining is the Federal Reserve is committed to supporting the markets. And the Fed chair said in the most recent meeting that the committee will be very patient with respect to increasing interest rates. So we'll likely see these low rates for an extended period of time, likely in even through 2021 or, or further out. Um, at, at the same time, from a strategy perspective, we're going to continue to be diligent with respect to uh, the Millennium Fund program. Um, it certainly has navigate. We've, we've helped to navigate and come out successfully on the other end of on the other end of the financial crisis in 0809. So we will continue to stay focused on the program's objectives um, and also carefully managing uh, risks along the way. Um, that was the uh, the end of my prepared comments, and I'm happy to entertain any questions if there are any. Any questions from uh, board members? Um, I will look over uh, to my right, Supervisor Crocker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Lauren, could you uh, share with us when the bonds are going to be paid off? That, um, and I will call on my colleague, Allison County, who is also on the line. It's my recollection the bonds were 30-year bonds to be paid off within the next 10 years. And again, I'm seeking counsel from my uh, colleague on the phone, Allison, if she has, um, if she can be 100% accurate on that remark. 
But if not, we can, we'll, I will confirm with uh, Mr. Britt and uh, he can share that information with you um, shortly after, after I wrap up uh, this item. Okay, thank you. That, that's what it looks like. It looks like based on um, the payment schedule that it's going to look at, that it's probably in that, in that range. So that makes sense. Um, yes, so I just wanted to make sure we didn't make any changes with the 2006 refunding and the refinancing. I just want to make sure we didn't extend that the maturity date wasn't extended at that time. Apologies okay. for the interruption. Very good. Um, so just and just for clarification, our um, our loan payment uh, for these is roughly 1.7 million dollars annually that we're required to fund? That, that is correct. And actually that amount changes depending on the interest rate environment because it is a variable rate uh, borrowing rate. So as I mentioned, the current borrowing rate is one month LIBOR plus a quarter of a percent. So every year during, um, and, and this is included, the detail is included in the uh, our administrator's report in, in the packet. But each year we calculate and estimate um, the full year's lease payments or debt service. And that's what gets deposited into the bond fund. Um, so for this year, we wanted to be conservative. And so we calculated an amount and added an additional 1%. So we, um, we added some cushion, if you will, for the year, which made it come out to be about 1.3, I'm sorry, $1.7 million, correct. Right. And so um, generally the way the fund was uh, set up was the annual tobacco um, receipts that we get from the state helps to pay off those, uh, those bond payments as well as go back into the kitty for uh, growing the fund. So with the 4.3 million that we're going to get roughly 4.3 million, we're um, actually going to be depositing after we pay off the uh, our payment for the bond 2.6 million and so that is correct and that 2.6 million so um, which gets me to the point of and I know we're going to be discussing this later on as far as the capital improvement plan um, uh, uh, we've we've taken out three and a half million the last several years I know it's recommended to take out three and a half million again um, but our fund, our overall fund is actually, we haven't lost any money out of the fund. So it's, it's, it has a, a very slight upward uh, change. So is that because of the investment values that we're getting the growth on? That is correct. So it, it is the, that is that return in excess of the borrowing rate, that 0.3% helps to grow the value of the fund. And because that's positive, you haven't seen a decline in value or had, you know, had a negative period. Um, I think since 2002, there was a, a, a negative period in there, but as you've seen on page, we'll go back a little bit. There's been a positive, um, what we call unwind position uh, since that time. And that's a result of the 0.3% on average uh, positive return relative to the borrowing rate since inception of the program. And the, uh the last question, and um, you've talked about this quite a bit is, or towards the end as far as um, current market conditions, are, are we concerned that we're going to be able to um, still be able to get um, you know, some returns that will continue to help grow the fund over the upcoming year, recognizing that uh, what markets are? Are we going to have a negative uh, balance if we pull out three and a half million this year? That's a great question. Um, we actually, if I'll go to page 10 here again, looking at the portfolio characteristics, because we locked in um, fixed rate securities in 2019 and even prior to that, um, the average yield of the portfolio is 1.6%. That will continue to decline as we have to reinvest maturity uh, into the new market environment. At the same time, we have um, quite a bit of cushion relative to the current borrowing rate of approximately 0.42%. So um, we have a nice spread um, going currently, 
So we don't feel that the program will be impacted. And at the same time, what I showed you on page six represents yields on US Treasury securities. Um, high quality corporate obligations have higher yields than treasuries, with all, which also helps us with um, achieving yields that are higher than the borrowing rate of, of one month LIBOR plus a quarter percent. So we still feel fairly confident that we'll be able to continue to achieve that excess earning spread, uh, similar to how we were able to do that during the 0809 crisis when um, short term interest rates were near 0% for approximately eight to nine years. So we're in a very similar interest rate environment and we're going to deploy similar investment strategies to help maintain that, that yield difference or spread between the investment return and the borrowing rate. Very good, thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Um, um, Mr. Chairman, CEO. thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, according to our comprehensive uh, countywide financial report, the bonds are set to mature on August 1st, 2034. Um, a couple Thank you. A couple questions for you, uh, Lauren. A couple questions and comments. And I think you kind of covered uh, one of the comments that I was going to make. Um, uh, just it, it's highlighted on page nine, and you talk about the uh, investment result uh, since inception. Um, seeing the spread of 0.3 um, is actually a, a really good indicator of uh, what we can expect in, in going forward. Um, the uh, crisis of 08, 09, uh, and the market environment then and the interest rates uh, during that time are, are fairly indicative of what we're going through currently, and yet we were still able to maintain that positive spread uh, since inception, uh, even given those times. So uh, take those out, it's probably even better than that. So I think that we uh, are fairly comfortable, and, and I think that it's it, we're conservatively limited by um, what we are allowed to take each year is the lesser of the um, uh, return each year or, or three and a half million dollars. It's not the greater of. So I think we're already positioned fairly well uh, to make sure that this fund continues to give to the county, so to speak. Would you agree with that? Yes, very much so. Thank you. Okay. That's a good summary. Um, and then I also wanted to uh, just ask, you know, um, I know that we allocate uh, our funds to um, what we consider high quality credit. And uh, just looking at how uh, those fund uh, allocations have changed, do you still see, um, I know that currently we are a little bit more heavily uh, balanced towards federal um, securities. Do you see us moving back into uh, the corporate notes um, anytime soon, or do you think that we're going to be uh, well put in the federal securities uh, for at least the near term? That is an excellent question, and I will I'll go back to page eight, which shows that that increase, especially year over year increase from March 19, 2019 to 2020, and that significant increase in federal agency securities. Um, we did that for a number of reasons. Um, one was there was a very, in, in 2019 and even prior to that, because you see there was no federal agency obligations in 2016 through 2018. Yeah. Um, that's because the yield difference between U.S. Treasuries and federal agencies was zero. Um, historically, that yield difference has been about a quarter of a percent, and that went to zero during um, the latter part of the financial crisis. So we moved out of agencies and into to U.S. Treasury securities. In the early part of 2020, um, we started to see, again, this flight to quality. Um, and we started to see the yield difference between treasuries and agencies start to widen out a little bit. And so we saw some good opportunities in federal agency obligations, and we wanted to take advantage of that. During that same period of time in March, we actually halted purchases, all purchases of corporate obligations, fixed rate or floating rate. Um, and even commercial paper, because we wanted to see uh, what was going to happen uh, in the marketplace and we didn't feel um, you know, it was the right opportunity or right idea to add uh, credit in, into the position until we knew what the markets were going to do. The Federal Reserve and Congress acted quickly with fiscal and monetary stimulus and started to steady the market. So we started reintroducing um, uh, credit back into the portfolio and we will probably continue to do that over time 
transferring out of those federal agency securities back into corporate obligations, which have a um, a wider spread or higher yield relative to relative to government securities. Yeah. Does that help? Yep. Very helpful. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Supervisor Shockley, has sure. a question. Hi, Lauren. Thank you for the report. Um, no questions, really. I just want to comment that, uh, you know, if we look back, you know, through the years, we have $56 million worth of capital improvements uh, because of the Millennium Fund. And I know a lot of times people say, well, we have, you know, all this money sitting there, uh, but we couldn't be doing what we're doing. And we'll have a report later on about um, the future, what will happen. And I think it's very important to to invest in the county, in our facilities, and in capital improvements. So. Um, thank you for the report. You know, I think it could have been kind of ugly uh, considering what's been going on, but uh, thank you for a good report. All right. Thank you, thank Supervisor. You. Appreciate the comment. Yeah, thank you very much, Lauren. Keep up the great work and uh, keep on moving those funds as needed. So ha have a great day, okay? And be safe and healthy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Y'all do the same. Really appreciate it. Thank Take you. Care. Okay, next we're going to move on to item two and take up a request to receive an update from the Health and Human Services Agency. Oh, oh we do have to, we do have to, I'm sorry, take a vote to receive the report formally. So, uh, Chair will entertain a uh, motion at this time. Have a motion from Supervisor Shuckley and a second from Supervisor Townsend. Please vote. All right, we have a motion that passed, a motion by Supervisor Shuckley and second by Supervisor Townsend. The vote is unanimous. Uh, we will now move on and take up item two. Uh, sorry about that, Tim, made you get up a little bit too early. Um, a request to receive an update from the Health and Human Services Agency on COVID-19 status and response efforts in Tulare County. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board, CAO and council, I'm Tim Lutz, Health and Human Services Agency Director. Um, pretty fairly um, succinct report this um, morning. There isn't a lot of um, changes over last week, um, most significant. So our, um, our case levels were roughly about the same as we saw the, the week prior. Um, this morning, we're at 11,549 individuals. Um, and it's important to note that's up um, 1,559 from last week. However, um, that also reflects now with the state's data um, data issues, a, a correction that we saw this morning, which was um, the 687 cases that um, came in. Those cases do um, reflect um, cases from the last two weeks. So it, it is important to note that um, you know, when you look at our, our curve and our weekly case numbers, we saw that um, increase and in kind of that, that huge peak the week of July 27th. And then we saw the dip that we talked about last week, but also noting the concerns with the state's, um, with the state's data glitch. And basically on, on one side, you had um, a, a um, expired security certificate from Quest Labs, which is the largest um, probably the largest commercial lab putting information into the system, or at least one of the largest. And um, that forced a delay in addition to um, a, a server outage with their um, with the system that was um, pulling the the positive results in and then sending them to the counties um, through the the state system. So um, we did receive those um, starting Sunday. Um, received a lot yesterday. As of this morning, staff are reconciling all of that information. Um, to be honest, the, uh, the 687 was better than I was, I was fearing and I'm hoping that, that that stays and you know there aren't an additional backlog that come through. And I only say that because um, it was approximately 1,900 cases that were coming over to us over the weekend. Now, um, our staff knew about a number of those through our redundant process and, and identifying early on through our public health lab, through Quia Delta, through um, any of our like family healthcare network where we knew we should have had positives that weren't necessarily in, in the state system. So um, our hope then is as, as we see what that final number is that while still very high, at least I'm showing 
um, a, a decline in our weekly cases and case rate. So um, as I talk through our statistics right now, I will just put that caveat out there that these statistics were generated um, from last week's data, which we know still has um, some errors. So next week, I would expect this to be adjusted a little bit, um, but then hopefully we'll be back on the right track for um, confidently being able to rely on information and comparisons from week to week. So our case rate um, did show a decline at, at this point, at least where we're projecting um, from 593.5 per 100,000 to 471.9 per 100,000. Um, and again, we're, we're looking to see kind of what we, where that finally lands. Um, feeling a little more comfortable with that number um, from even the report that was generated yesterday um, with information this morning. And where we can see and know that we had the discrepancy is if you look at um, the, the two different data elements, you have the report date or the rate by episode date. There are two different ways to look at that. Episode date typically being at least initially when the specimen was collected. Um, could be adjusted further if, um, if through the investigation process it's determined what the actual onset of symptoms date would be that might be the adjustment um, to reflect that episode date. Whereas the report date is simply the date that that report um, comes to us and is acknowledged in the system as a positive case. So when we, when we look at that, we know based on what we would expect to be seen, what our, um, what our actual report date and, and therefore case rate should be, um, and we see a, a, quite a significant gap between the um, episode date and that report date. Um, looking at this morning's numbers, the gap is much closer, and as we reconcile it, I imagine next week it'll be um, closer still. There's always gonna be a little bit of a discrepancy between those because it's based on when the time that that positive was recorded, but it's still the, the same information, just attributing a different date to it. And then um, our positivity rate, um, a, also appears to you know, more or less be um, where we were the prior week. Um, our estimated, which is still an estimated from prior week because of waiting for this new information, um, was 13.4%. Right now we're at an estimated 13.5% on, um, on the positivity rate. And again, I would expect um, adjustments, although normally we see that adjusting down, um, it's not clear which direction it might go. Um, last week's did seem to stabilize and it didn't adjust too much, but um, we'll, we'll see once all of those new numbers are processed um, over this week. And then um, additionally, the R effective um, is calculated right now at 0.9. Um, again, I want to caution reliance on that number until we get our, our um, updated information, but certainly, um, you know, the, when you look at the metrics that we're seeing right now, um, there is a clear downward trend, um, so I want to just urge caution in terms of we want to make sure that as um, the errors get corrected with the data coming over to us that we do actually see um, positive trending, but also recognizing that even if it is positive trending, we, um, we still have a long way to continue to go. We've seen kind of these dips before, and then we see the um, spike back up. Um, so what we want to continue to emphasize is that um, diligence on wearing masks, avoiding gatherings, and socially distancing. Moving on to hospitalizations, um, also some, um, some initially positive news here where I'm seeing a 3% decrease over the last week, um, 101 to 98 hospitalizations, obviously a, a small number, but it's not increasing right now. Um, we also know from um, the states, um, statewide hospitalizations, they're down around 19% over the last um, two weeks. So hoping again, um, the, the trending on hospitalizations holds. Um, when you look at um, modeling, and I typically don't necessarily talk about the modeling here because it, it, they're forecasts based on, um, based on assumptions, but um, important to note on the modeling, um, 
you know, usually the models are pretty disparate in terms of what they um, are projecting for hospitalizations. A lot of the models are, are you know, coalescing a bit more around um, more stabilized hospitalizations. Um, and of course, again, those models are going to be based entirely on our actions and whether, um, you know, again, gatherings increase, whether we start to see larger um, infection areas. So um, what it tells us, though, is that it looks like we're, we're doing some of the right things, putting the right measures in place, and we want to continue down um, that path and continue to reinforce those um, actions. In terms of um, state activity, so um, the unified support team, we do have our scheduled um, on-site visit um, tomorrow and Thursday. Um, it will be a full two-day agenda um, covering quite a few um, topics that really are um, looking at factors influencing the spread of COVID, but then also barriers um, that are impacting our coordinated response to the, to the mitigation of the disease. Um, key topics that we're gonna be discussing, um, farm worker, ag worker, outreach and engagement, schools, um, daycares and camps and day camps, business outreach and compliance, um, assisted living congregate care settings, um, we have some session or a session set aside to talk about city specific concerns and engagement and then another for um, tribal tribal specific concerns and engagement and then some broader discussions on enforcement contact tracing testing capacity um, data management and the state system and healthcare capacity and hospital surge so again a very full two days um, we when we talked to the state, we were able to flexibly set our agenda. Some counties did a very condensed version. Others really brought in um, a broader coalition of, of community partners. We felt um, this was an opportunity for us to really bring a lot of the partners together and hopefully have a um, productive discussion on, um, on some of the, the key factors that are influencing the spread, but also ways that we can um, try and, and coordinate and target that engagement um, on the back end of, of this discussion. The, um, and as such, then, our, our list of invitees is, a, is pretty extensive, encompassing representatives from county departments, such as the Sheriff's Department, Ag Commissioner, Workforce Investment, and others, um, our cities, schools, um, Thule Tribe, community nonprofits and community-based organizations, hospitals, and members from the business community. Um, so again, we're really wanting to encourage that discussion in talking to other counties that have gone through the unified support team visits. We know that the state's really wanting to, to look at Central Valley specific um, impacts and ways that not only can they address some of the concerns here in Tulare, but we can be coordinating with our, with our regional neighbors um, in the Central Valley that are experiencing similar types of, of challenges. So then moving um, quickly then through some of our um, DOC operations and updates, um, Department of Defense, the, the staff that are assigned to Cuya Delta, we did get a 15 day extension. Um, we asked for 30, um, not certain if it's just the, their process of, of doing it in 15 day increments. Um, I anticipate that we'll ask for an extension again on that, but at this point we did get um, 15 days and takes us through um, mid August. We also, um, on the Porterville Alternative Care site, got it right. Um, the, the staff um, throughout the region have been um, working with their local hospitals, respectively, and the state to try and clarify some of the admission criteria for PACs, um, recognizing that um, the entire region is benefiting from it being um, being here and we do not want to see it, it go away. I think at this point um, with the census now um, taking back up, the state has kind of back, backed up on any discussion about um, a stand down for that site for the time being. We'll continue to, to keep um, that closely on the radar and working with them and certainly I'm sure that'll be a topic during our um, surge capacity and, and hospitalizations um, with the state unified support teams um, this week. 
and then on our industry and community um, liaison teams, um, on the, the strike team referrals, we now have a total of 30 referrals that have been made to the state enforcement strike team. Um, those um, include gyms, restaurants, bars, hair and nail salons. The, the area that seems to be the biggest challenge for us right now is um, smaller private gyms, particularly in the Visalia area that have been um, that have really just opened and not um, been compliant at all with outdoor um, activities, allowing um, inside workouts um, without without all the measures in place. So th those ones have become significant problem areas for us over the last um, few weeks. And talking with the city on the city manager call, um, the, the cities also have been made aware of some of the concerns and and um, and voice some of their own. And then um, thank you, Supervisor, for um, the acknowledgement on the Allensworth um, collection event. We have a the second one scheduled for next Monday. Um, I got the number this morning. We did 117 collections um, for um, the um, for swabs yesterday. So hopefully then we'll um, get a, a also equally good response next week and then gauge the, the demand um, and need elsewhere. And then um, we did yesterday um, get our finalized school waiver guidance out to our TK to sixth grade um, school partners. Um, the letter and waiver application and requirements were sent out and posted. Um, our support team is, is ready to, um, to, to review those waivers um, with the stipulation that they wouldn't be granted until we met the state's criteria for the um, 200 cases per 100,000 population. But again, the key piece is working with our um, school district so that when we get to that point, um, we are prepared to move quickly. And then I um, closing our um, total costs to date, um, 3.883 million for the DOC response um, and, and, and again, all of the ancillary support activities that are encompassed within that. Then we also, on Project Room Key, 102 individuals being served um, last week, we provided 434 nightly rooms. Um, total costs for that program, 598,366, um, which will be nice because I, I believe that puts us pretty close to maximizing the grant funds that we got for that program. And then we're also preparing um, the close of escrow for 99 Palms this week and working with all the logistical um, mechanisms for transferring ownership and um, responsibility and oversight for the property. And that concludes my report. Um, quick question, a couple, couple since you just brought it up. Uh, 99 Palms, uh, that's actually going to be owned by the uh, nonprofit arm of the uh, housing authority, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, through a, a lease, uh, yeah, a lease back where the county, ha you know, pays for yeah, but that th lease. Th it's but not yeah. county ownership. Sorry, yes. Yep. Just wanted to make sure that was pointed out. Um, on the uh, return to school and the granting of waivers, um, those uh, who have applied or may need to tweak their waiver application uh, as a result of the guidance that was just issued by Public Health yesterday, um, are, are you still planning to coordinate and work with those uh, waiver applicants so that when we do stabilize in our cases, um, that they will then be able to open and not have to wait that 14 days following uh, the submission of their waiver. I, I know that you have to have stable rates uh, of less than 200 per 100,000 for a rolling 14-day period, but we would have to tag on another 14 days on top of that if we waited until we got to that point. Yeah, and I understand Correct. that concern, and, and our goal is absolutely to avoid a 30-day wait as a or 28-day wait as opposed to a 14-day wait. So we are um, working on on the mechanics of that, recognizing that the goal is that 14 day, you know, as, as, as much as we can assure that our case rates are looking sure. good, but we can open schools. Sure, that, that'd be great. And then uh, you want to comment on your um, facilitation of the, the strike team or the state outreach team. 
Um, I, I was really glad to hear, I had a question that I wanted to ask about that in terms of who set the agenda, but I'm very glad to hear you say that it was set by yourself and our local partners because I think that uh, each COVID outbreak is unique in different communities, have uh, unique characteristics that need to be addressed. And so when we set the agenda, we were able to tailor the meeting and the outreach, the state effort or expenditure of resources um, to help meet the needs specifically of Tulare County. So uh, thank you very much for that. And again, please do pass on uh, our thank you uh, to your public health team. You guys continue to do uh, tremendous work day in, day out. And uh, the, the tough is, I'm sorry, the, the going is definitely getting tough, um, but you guys are doing a great job and uh, really holding the line and keeping Tulare County moving forward in whatever way we can uh, when we have uh, state you know, lo clamping down on uh, what we're able to do here locally. So uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, Supervisor Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate the report and all of the hard work. A um, couple of things you were mentioning uh, with, with the state's correction and, and the addition of the 687 cases. How does that exactly work? Do uh, I was kind of under the assumption that we knew how many cases we were counting, and then we sent them to the state. But is it that the lab sent it to the state first and then the state sends us back the positives, negatives? So a little of both. Um, because we have really tried to emphasize local capacity with, um, again, Cuya Delta, um, Family Health Care Network, and also our public health lab, we know a lot of those cases. So um, our correction today was was I would say less than certainly a number of other counties that don't necessarily have some of the redundancy built in. Um, we also have requested faxes from the commercial labs. It's not 100% that we get those faxes, so our numbers, what we expect um, might vary a little bit, but in what we're seeing right now, it looks like we're, we're pretty close, which is, which is good. Um, but there is definitely a number of labs that if somebody's going to you know, a, a primary care, they do a collection, we might not see it um, until it gets, gets input into that state system. So those do go to the state first and then come back, and that's also been the source of the, the little lag that you've been talking about for, for a while now on the positives coming, coming back. So that's why we've had to make those, those true ups. Okay, that answers my question on that. Um, also, and on our end, um, where we kind of changed the way that we were looking at the recoveries, uh, and that made, made, of course, a huge difference whenever we got that cleaned up. Is that completely cleaned up now, or we, have we captured all of the recoveries or non-reports? We, we have captured the recoveries. Occasionally, you'll see a larger um, decrease. What's happening, unfortunately, going back to us not always getting data from the state on positives, we might get a positive that was two, three weeks old yeah. um, that, at, at Unfortunately, by the time our contact investigators and um, tracers get it, um, it's a recovered case. And so that becomes a, a frustration point where you see the positive come in, but then we're, we're basically closing it out of the system once we receive it. So uh, occasionally, if, if there's a correction, we know that does happen occasionally. Um, there, in our call with the state, um, and there have been a few calls over the last week on the data system, I think um, there, there is still some, some concern. I think that there are some errors within the system that the state's asking counties to um, also be on the lookout for and do some internal kind of testing of, of those assumptions. So um, given that we see those late labs, I think that's very indicative that that the system's not perfect and we're getting some results later than, than we really should be, particularly if we're gonna do effective investigation. Right, well, that's, uh, it's great to hear that we're doing so much, that we have that redundancy there so that we can kind of spot those things that are happening uh, in both cases, appreciate that. Uh, and the last thing, um, during the meetings with the, uh, with the State Unified Support Team, um, I had asked a question of you and your department uh, this last week and thanks for getting back to me with a nice, thorough answer on uh, basically regarding a number of testing or the amount of testing we do per capita and how that compared. And, and uh, as you uh, got back to me, you pointed out that we are doing a, a, you know, a, a big amount of testing compared to 
uh, the rest of the state that we're ranking right up there. And at the same time, uh, prioritizing the testing to those that are uh, in the most need of it. Uh, so in other words, the ones that are sick. <laughs> so our positivity rates, um, uh, you know, if we just assume a, a, a an average positivity rate, but we're testing more than everybody else, then of course, we're gonna look like we have uh, higher higher positives. And so I just, if that discussion could come up, I, I'm gonna, you know, zoom in uh, on the time, the couple of hours that we have there, but uh, if we don't get to it at that time, I, I sure would appreciate if you just brought it up with the team and see if there's a way that we could address the fact that we're doing such a great job with testing <laughs> that sometimes it can make us look a little worse than maybe we actually are in comparison to the rest of the state. And I appreciate it. Of course, thank you. Thank you for that feedback before the, the site visits. Appreciate it. Yep. Supervisor Valero. All right. Thank you, Tim, for that great report this morning. Um, so I just had two things. One, um, just for clarification, and I'm speaking to the July 31st, August 4th kind of um, mishap from the state. Um, so when I'm looking at an upcoming SIP report, we will see kind of those numbers um, included. However, um, will you then go back and input those in their respective dates, correct? So th that, that's been a discussion that we've been having on, on one side, um, because there are impacts on any way we do it. Um, I, I think what we're trying to look at though is at least apply it from when, when those um, numbers should have been entered into the system so that we can have some consistency in what our calculation is. Um, that's a, a question that I know um, we talked about yesterday with our EPI folks and I would imagine um, again now that we they were able to really start to dig through and parse out that data um, we should have a definitive answer and I can give you an update on that next week for what the ultimate resolution was. We're, we're trying to align with some consistency with the state. It's not quite clear how the state's going to make the correction. Um, and so we're, we're just trying to, before we make a definitive, this is the methodology we'll use, we want to make sure that it doesn't have an unintended consequence somewhere else. Yeah. Well, because it will impact the way we look at it um, yes. in all different angles. Um, and then I just wanted to go back to the schools and our workings with the schools and just making sure that there is equity involved um, because I know that um, there is a possibility where we may have some school districts uh, with greater staff that can put in those waivers quickly, um, whether it be private or public schools. And so just making sure that, that when we do our outreach that that no one is lagging behind and that there is equity between our rural and urban um, schools as well as other resources that we can provide uh, these school districts so that when we, when we do have that opportunity to open up, that we're opening up consistently and across the board uh, with all schools um, moving forward. And I think that's a, a great point. And I will say from preliminary discussions, uh, again, we've been um, we expect more discussions on waivers coming. Um, a number of, um, of public schools, particularly in our smaller unincorporated areas, have expressed interests in, in waivers, and we are um, certainly working with them in addition to um, you know, private schools that are reaching out. Great. Thank you. All right. And Supervisor Crocker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just on no that note, I'd, I'd say that... Um, Conceptually, I think that the schools opening and being equitable is, is a good idea, especially when it when we look at private versus public. But I would caution, and I, I would not be supportive of holding back waivers um, because I think the bigger issue is large school districts versus small school districts and larger schools versus smaller schools um, just because of capacity issues and being able to have more flexibility with social distancing. And so... I wouldn't want to hold back small schools. Um, if we had the option for them to open up, then I, I would encourage all opening um, uh, prior to holding back, assuming we get to that point. Um, Supervisor Townsend uh, hit on the one question as far as um, how we receive testing. Um, and so j just for clarification, I know we, we put that in there, but um, we have uh, just over 1,700 active cases, and that's really what we're looking at as far as people that are 
out and about that still have uh, COVID-19 uh, based on the recoveries that we have. That's correct. Um, the, you, you talked about the, um, I, I want, I like a little bit of clarification on the rate by episode date versus the rate by report date. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that they're growing closer and you also kind of said later on that you didn't want to say whether or not they're declining or growing or you weren't sure what, what that looked like. But based on what we're seeing in your report, it does look like they're declining. So even if it may not be declining at the rate that it looks like currently, do we still think that that's a declining rate overall? It does appear to be that case. Okay. And then that's where I say I want to urge caution. Right. Um, I know the, the governor went out Monday, last Monday, and said things were looking better. Um, and then this error came up. But I, I do believe based on this, we are seeing a dip. And is there a possibility of um, utilizing that rate by episode date versus the rate by report date? Because it seems like that's that's really the number that gets to when people actually have contracted the virus versus and what we should be using versus um, just when it was actually reported. And I think that, you know, again, recognizing that these numbers are going to change um, very quickly, but um, that would help out our, our situation as far as um, getting closer to that 200 cases per 100,000 mark uh, as far as schools are concerned. Well, and my caution on that, and, and that's where with that particular graph, what we're trying to highlight is the disparity between the state system. We should see them far closer together. So as, as the new data gets updated input, I would expect that curve to be a little closer. Um, but you are right in terms of when you look at the lagging episode date typically is going to have a, a better case rate um, and positivity even at times than it will with the actual report date. Um, and that is something that we're, we're looking at for, you know, how are we being consistent with what the state's monitoring list is, is basing it on and what we've been reporting locally. If we do make changes to our data methodology, we'll just need to make sure we are articulating why we had the, the change um, and why we feel that that's the better course. Right, because it's more accurate. Very good. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Supervisor Shucklin. I know you didn't put in a request, but do you have any comments since everyone else did? I'm good. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. I appreciate it and uh, wish you luck out there and be safe and healthy. Thank you. All right, moving on now, we will take up uh, item three, which is public comments. Um, at this time, members of the public may comment on any item uh, that is under the jurisdiction of the Board of Supervisors, but not on today's agenda. Uh, public comment can and will be limited through two, three minutes. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under public comment? It is Adam Peck. I couldn't tell with that mask on. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair, Supervisors, CAO, and Council. I, uh, Adam Peck, uh, Workforce Investment Board. Wanted to provide a bit of an update on the small business relief program that the, the board authorized a few short weeks ago um, and answer any questions and, and, and get any, any input that's appropriate at this time. So the, um, the program, as all of you know, I know you've been paying close attention. I appreciate how you've amplified uh, the message on, on the fund um, out into the public in, in your district. Um, and so thus far, as of this morning, well, I actually looked right now, but it's, it's not the data. We have, I think, as of right now, like 726 applications, um, which represents a, a, a tre it's a tremendous number. It's well short of the number that this, the board authorized uh, to fund, and, and we can discuss that. Um, so I'm going to provide you some information uh, related to it. That did not turn out looking well. 
Um, imagine that there's a chart underneath those, those, those numbers of bar graph that didn't translate. Um, this, this is the number of applications by each, each day um, that we've received. It's actually in the, the timing on how they do the days, it's like an international date or something. So it shows 37 applications as of this morning that wasn't quite true. But you can see that the first couple days of the application, first three days, we had big application numbers. And that's because there, for about a week and a half ahead of time, there were, there were folks being made aware, and they received an email the, the moment that that kicked off. And so we had that big push the first few days. Dwindled through the week. That August 8th and 9th was the weekend. It really dwindled. And then it picked back up again yesterday, and it looks like it's picking up again today. So the, um, the breakdown by district thus far, and um, the, these are by percentages, and we're still doing some data cleanup on the applications that come in to look up the districts, but you can see uh, District 3 has a, a large chunk of it, followed by District 1, then District 4, then, then District 5 and 2. And for each of you, I have the breakdown by each of the communities within each of the district. And it, it, it can be a little bit deceiving at time because we take the city. City does not always mean incorporated area. I grew up in right between Farmersville and Visalia. I had a Visalia address, but wasn't in the city of Visalia. So you, you have those kinds of things. And so um, uh, we, but we have the, the breakdown by each mailing address um, city to to uh, to provide um, uh, to each of you, but you know the um, we, we'll do some further analysis of how businesses are distributed across. We know we had done a little bit of that going in, and and the fact is that uh, that roughly a little over oh about sixty some percent of the businesses of Tulare County are are in Visalia, and we do also, also job postings, but. I think it's important, it's, it's more work. So all of our social media posts, we, we've been boosting, we've been boosting them to all the outlying areas so that, the, it, that, that our, our efforts are targeted um, outside of, of um, the of Visay area where we've gotten a, a good number of applications thus far. So this, this is some Google Analytics on just the website, the, the, the activity on the website, we've, we have you can see, and, and the, the, actually that August 5th little bump date was some weird kind of link stuff getting sent, so that's not quite real. But we've gotten about 4,000 users, and you can see again it declined and then picked up again yesterday. And we're able to tell which city those searches, those, those folks who came to the website, where they came from. And you can see again, um, Visalia, you know, you can see a lot of the communities in, um, throughout Tulare County um, that are representative of, of uh, those who have gone to the website. Um, and also we have, I don't put this on here, but the source data, it's been either folks going directly from, from um, emails they've received uh, from, the, from the, the web or the chamber, those who've signed up, any that you've sent out, or through Facebook, that represents a huge portion. Some directly from the individual chambers, uh, some from uh, posts that like EDC or others have, have done, and so, but a lot direct or through Facebook has been a uh, main conduit of people finding out about it. Um, okay, and, and oh, let me go back. I'm not sure what that was. Um, and we try to really make, for uh, many of you have seen this and probably walked through the application, we tried to make it really, really simple. And from some early feedback, um, we we made we simplified it even further, and and that has allowed people to get through it pretty simply. It's also caused some complication in the information we've re received. Uh, we try to be very clear about what's all, what are allowable expenses, and then we ask people. We kind of knew. Let's let's tell people what they can spend it on, then ask people what they're going to spend it on. Often. They will then tell you they're going to spend it on things that you said you couldn't spend it on. But it, so that's we're going to have we have to we then go back to those folks and just to make clear to them what the allowable uses are, so that so that they don't end up in a situation where where they're spending the money in a way that's not appropriate. Um, now, even as simple as we make it, um, you know, people are going to have questions. They're they're the, the the folks who we're trying to target are folks who 
we expect to, to need, they, this has all been a bunch of noise to them, so we, we've tried to make it easy for them to ask questions on the site or in the midst of the application itself, and this represents the conversations we've had within the chat function of, of the, uh, the website and applications submitted with the website. So on a daily basis, we have people monitoring questions that come up on the chat, responding to those, clarifying any issues folks have. Those, so that's 372 conversations over those days with, with much back and forth that, that um, our staff are, um, are, are helping out with that. Um, so as it stands, the application deadline is August 16th this Sunday. Um, and so we are, we're uh, continuing to push out the word, talking to all the chambers and community partners, looking for ideas, any, any kind of avenue for, for um, promoting the idea. Uh, and uh, from uh, many of you have reposted social media posts we've done, I think even generating your own social media posts, as many of you've done, or out through any, any networks you have. It, we, see, we see a boost every time that anything like that uh, happens. And we've had uh, a great deal of uptake on, on those social media posts and each time the chamber puts information out. But we wanna make sure, I still hear every day people who don't think it's meant for them when they are exactly who it's meant for. And I will say this, without, as I, I'm constantly going through what the who the applicants are, they are the type of applicants I believe this board intended to see. It's, it, you see the barber shops and the nail salons and the daycares and the, the kind of main street businesses you would, that you hoped to reach out to and the small restaurants and that, that, those are the applicants that you are seeing. We just know there are many more out there and that we just have to continually get the word um, out in a way that people realize that this actually is for them. So just brief update, happy to provide any more information. Um, I, I don't have a chart on this, but we do offer this in English and Spanish. We've had, of those 715, about 35 of them thus far have been, were completed in Spanish. There, there are many folks who prefer Spanish but still completed in English, I, I think, as well, but we've had 35 completed in Spanish, and I have the, the breakdown of, of which cities those come through as well. Well, Adam, normally we don't respond during public comment, but because this is a, uh, an update and you're looking for feedback from the board regarding this program, I definitely think it's appropriate that we make a few uh, comments for you. Um, one comment that I have, I've heard from several businesses that they have, uh, that they have not applied. They are confused because they said that they've received a benefit from a federal program, and I clarified for them that it depends upon which program you received assistance from, because I know like some of the uh, uh, direct uh, advances from the IDLE program were, you know, the request was for $10,000 and they received 1,000. So there, there's, it, there's absolutely a gap and a huge need there, and, and even some others have received an allocation, but it was only enough to get them through, you know, a month, and here we are, uh, five, six months into this thing. So um, maybe some kind of guidance or FAQ um, information that could be pushed out to people that says, hey, if you've received this type of program, um, you still are able to apply. Because I, I think, what, what do we say? If you receive PPP, you're not able to. Um, and, and there are some specific restrictions, but just some clarity there, because I think there's an initial reaction that, oh, I got something, I can't apply for this. Uh, and I just want to make sure that we're still meeting the need for those who have the need, but feel like they were excluded from this. Um, no, you're exactly right. Um, this is uh, the, the application and from the, the, the direction our agreement with the county, those who have received PPP and the EIDL loan, not eligible for this because it's other CARES Act yes. funding, but that we carved out through discussions with CAO the EIDL advance, because as you said, there are a lot of folks who, here's a common thing folks would say. I applied for the, the, that SBA loan, sometimes yeah. they don't even know what it is, yeah. 
And I never really heard anything back, but I got $1,000 in my bank account that was somehow from that. And I don't know, I, in, in that we say that was the advance, which is confusing because it's not even a loan advance. It's this little grant program they did inside the EIDL. So we, at, we, we, we have an FAQ on that, and we ask questions to try to get between an EIDL and the EIDL advance. Um, and we've struggled with how to communicate it because sometimes just this conversation we just have make people like say, I'm out. <laughs> you know, that sounds like, that sounds complicated yeah. all of a sudden. So we, we've tried to, we ask people in a way that to try to, to determine between those and when we try to follow up with individual in, in case, because you're right, the EIDL advance specifically, I don't have the numbers for Tulare County, but I ran them statewide. And if you look at Paycheck Protection Program, EIDL and EIDL advance, many, many more received EIDL advance because they, they gave that $1,000 based upon the number of employees. They were pretty free to let that money flow. But so you end up with someone sole proprietor, they got $1,000 out of that. And so um, we, we have, we've tried in a, in a few social media, both in our FAQ and a few social media posts to, to provide some direction distinguishing that and encourage people um, to apply, but it, it, is a, it is something that we're struggling with in terms of trying to message out, because a lot of people, so we try to act, anytime someone, I just had a message I sent to someone just now, anytime they say, oh, I don't apply, I'm always, I'm always interested to see, tell me why you didn't apply. And sometimes it is, we got Paycheck Protection Program, sometimes it's a misunderstanding of, of something that we still tried to make um, pretty simple. So we, we try to encourage people every time to, to ask us, talk to us before they kind of screen themselves out. But, thanks. Uh, Supervisor Shockley. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Uh, a couple of questions. The numbers that you're showing us, are these the, the actual approved applications? No, they are, they are the number of submitted applications. There is, um, we are in the process. There are many pieces to the approval. Was it, com we're, and we're, we're working, I really wanted to commend um, Cass, Tara, and the team at the auditor's office for, they're, they're going in and looking at the, the property taxes or any delinquent property tax. They're going in and creating vendors so that they're, they're able to pay once that they're approved. We are making sure they have a good, that the documents they uploaded are appropriate documents, that how they said they're gonna spend the money is appropriate. I would say uh, we're in the midst of that process. I, I wouldn't hazard how many are considered, we have some disqualified, they just literally weren't, weren't they didn't meet the qualification and somehow it didn't screen them out. But I would say the vast majority are qualified or at least will be qualified once um, we, work with them on how they're going to spend the money and such. And that's another question I was going to ask. I got a message from somebody that they didn't qualify. It was a, a hairstylist, single booth rental, something about her earnings uh, in 2020 in the same period of 2019 were more because of the additional unemployment. That's where we, we what we ended up settling on. And so that's someone that probably went the first day uh, is probably when probably, they applied. Yeah. Uh, or within the first day and a half, because we, we had a conversation on, on last Tuesday. We had really focused on loss of revenue before, and, and we had some questions in there that got really down to it. We broadened it to just negative financial impact, because the, there are those who maybe didn't lose revenue, but had increase in expenses related to responding to this. You see a you know, number of restaurants that have had to put out uh, outdoor things. So, you could be making the same revenue and still be in a negative position. Um, so we simplified that, um, but we still wanted to see that there's a negative financial impact. If, if, you, had, if you have a, a business that has like little to no overhead, there are some of those do exist, and you've got pandemic unemployment assistance, you may not have had a, a negative financial right. impact. And we, we, that's not where you want to add to, but, but we left it pretty broad. If they can attest that they had a negative financial impact, whether it's in, in all those kind of pieces, revenue or expense, then they, they become eligible. And then they have eligible expenses, rent, utilities, and COVID-related expenses, the types of things you, you're doing through PPE or to do social distancing or outdoor dining or whatever the case may be. Um, and the, where we had confusion early on, too, is when we say you must have 20 or fewer employees. People take things in a way you don't expect. 
they, someone says, well, I have zero employees, I'm an independent contractor, so I don't have, they took 20 or fewer, meaning some number of employees, just fewer than 20, so we had to like clarify, zero employees is among those that are fewer than 20, so. Okay. And then you mentioned, you, you mentioned a few types of businesses, and I was wondering, will we eventually get a, a report on like a breakdown of, you know, how many with 20, how many, you know, with 10, how many sole proprietors? Yeah, we can do a breakdown of the business type and the number of employees, and we're gonna we're working on going back later. We're uh, and and we didn't ask people to classify their their industry because they do a, a from other data. I know they do a very poor job of self classifying, but we're going back through and creating classification so I can do a breakdown of of industry as well um, as, as we get to that that point of funding. Okay. And then my last question is, we had talked at the beginning, um, so after the 16th, if um, not all, you know, have been approved or there's additional, so what will happen then? Well, that's up to the, the, the board, the, the county. Um, you know, we, we've been operating on the idea that this need to be a very, uh, because of the need to expend funds and then, or reallocate if there's lack of expenditure, so that's, that's, you know, up to, we, we can be flexible in terms of what the county wants to do from there. Um, once we hit that deadline, I can come back that uh, next Tuesday and give you a status of where it's at and, and, and make a decision. Dispersing them, yeah. you know, some into other districts and whatnot, so, all right. It, yeah, just dispersing them into other districts and then, you know, e even there's uh, some potential for, I, I know the request has come from various cities for some additional assistance where we can tie the assistance that's provided by a city to a, you know, a business or business type uh, services or programs, upgrades, et cetera. That might be something we'd consider as a, as a county too. Supervisor, or I'm sorry, not supervisor, wow. CAO. Wow. Okay. Wow. Doctor, congratulations, yeah. Jason. <laughs> I prefer to be the CEO. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no, just quickly, I think um, at, towards the end of this week, Adam and I and our group will have to sort of get together and sort of make some decisions. Of, you know, there's one question of one: Do we did we meet our 1500 threshold? And if we didn't, then is there some opportunity to maybe extend the application process? For a few days, we, you know, there there is going to be a hard deadline because of just the yeah. timing to get everything out. So we'll do our best, I think, to between the chambers and WIB and everybody uh, to to get the message out and get applications. So that's that'll be one decision. If we end up in the over, if we end up, and then then we'd have to make a decision about if if uh, one district is oversubscribed and how do we then sort of pass that out so there's some more discussions that have to be happening but in terms of the extension piece we may have opportunity to extend the deadline application deadline by a few days but i'd hesitate to make that that commitment today not knowing what's going to come in the rest of the week yeah thank you adam supervisor crocker thank you mr chair i'd um well i appreciate the update as Good stuff, and um, if you could um, share with us the the PowerPoint presentation, um, that would be helpful. Um, have we done uh, any outreach to ag associations? I'm thinking specifically Farm Bureau, as there isn't necessarily there isn't any um, requirements as far as business type that can that can apply. And I know we've done a lot of. Uh, outreach with our chambers of commerce, but typically um, ag-related businesses may not necessarily be associated with that. No, I'll, I'll follow up with uh, uh, with Trisha. I, I believe she has okay. posted a couple of things. She's definitely asked some questions and clarifications around some of the same issues that have that have, that have come up here. But I, I'll reach out to her and um, and work with her on the best way to message that out and then we're trying to do some of that to make sure those who might not think they apply whether it's nonprofits or churches as a sub mm -hmm. subsection of nonprofits or or like I say ag industry some folks who have been excluded or some of the, the the folks that are just buying a booth in a nail salon that there are there are avenues for them to be eligible as well well and I've even heard short-term rental owners you know whether or not that's uh, eligible and you know I if you if it's a business, if you follow the the criteria, then apply. I mean, what are they going to 
we're going to tell you no, and it took you 30 minutes to fill it out. Uh, and it doesn't, you know, and I tell you, there, if you have, it doesn't take 10 minutes yeah. to apply. If, I mean, so it depends yeah. on where your tax return is. It depends <laughs> if you can find your tax, but sometimes you don't even need, I mean, it's, we, there are a number of different, if you have anything that, that really shows the business, you take a picture of it. I would say about half of the folks are applying on their phone directly, and, and it was made to be simple enough to, to do that. That's great. And then uh, um, I just, as far as uh, if they're, you know, if, as we evaluate and see how many uh, businesses do apply, um, I would be in favor of, um, I don't have a problem with extending it for a short period of time, but I'd be in favor of looking at um, increasing the dollar amount. So, and then, you know, but keeping with the same uh, guidelines that we've stated, and so it's a one size fits all, it's not, um, so that's easy to administer, but if we have, if we only get a thousand applications in, which was actually the, was the first um, uh, recommendation to have a thousand businesses um, receive the funds, then, you know, being able to bump that up to maybe $7,500 um, or, or some, you know, variation or something where um, they could get uh, some more dollars and, and help out a little bit more, because I, I think that, um, I think that's still reasonable and we can we can easily justify that they can use all those to cover expenses that are COVID related since the pandemic has started. Or maybe increase the number of employees. Or, th or that too, and we did talk about that too. For somebody to right. apply for five and then, right. then we'd bump it up to 75. Right, but I, but I think if we did that, that might require some more time yeah. um, that we'd need to make sure that those businesses had the ability to apply more. Supervisor Valero. Yes. Um, so I'd just like to echo uh, Supervisor Shucklian, um with the idea of potentially increasing the number of employees. Uh, not so sure about the increase in dollars per, uh, but increasing the employee number. Um, in addition to that, uh, the question that was asked about the ag community, uh, do you, have you seen going along the same lines of nonprofits? Have nonprofits been uh, applying to this or not as much? And many. We, we, we definitely have seen that. Um, and it, it has been a good mixture. So there have been nonprofits. It's hard to know relative, it's hard for me to judge relative to the, the number of, of relative businesses in each industry, but we definitely have seen a, a fair number of, of nonprofit organizations. All right. And then just lastly, this is more as uh, a um, thank you. Um, I know that I have had a lot of businesses um, with inquiries and I have been able to relay that information to you and your team. Sylvia Marie, who is overseeing District 4, has been phenomenal in responding back to uh, the business inquiries within the hour, within even uh, two hours. And so it's just amazing to see your commitment and your uh, consistent um, approach with everyone that has been um, asking as well as trying to find out uh, about this service. So. Again, thank you to the WIB for your work. Thank you. Anything uh, further from uh, my colleagues? Seeing none, thank you very much. I appreciate your help, uh, Adam, and all your diligent work and of your staff as well during this time. Uh, next public comment, please come forward, state your name and address. Mr. Chair, we have okay. a phone call. We do have phone comment. Uh, please go ahead, uh, Madam Clerk. Good morning, thank you for holding. You're now connected to the board meeting. Please state your name and address for the record. Your three minutes will begin now. Good morning, Monica Crandall. Address is 566 Aston Lindsay, California. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi, good morning board. I'm, I work out of Chilevis County. My name is Monica. Um, I've been in the Working for in-home support services for now about three years. Um, started working uh, the healthcare like CNA since I was 11, caring for my mother. Um, so that shows you what passion I have working for the elderly. Now, um, I'm very. I wanted to speak to the board. I would rather in person than over the phone. But um, the wage increase. We should, of course, invest. See if they can come upon an agreement to give the dollar raise. You know, 
we know that it should be more. I work for another company, and both companies offer no benefits whatsoever. No vacation pay. We have sick time, but most of us can't afford to take time off, not even with sick time. So it's a little frustrating. We go, go from one job to another, and we're just because it's not the wage that brings us back. It's the people, it's the elderly working for the elderly. It's a passion, and a lot of us work very, very hard, very hard. Like I say, no no medical insurance whatsoever. Um, so we're fighting for that dollar raise. It should be more, honestly. Um, like I said, I work for another company, and this is it's not the wage that brings me back. It is the, you know, the passion that I have for working in the field. So just wanted to see if you guys can come on to, come into like an agreement of giving us a, a wage increase that we deserve. There's a lot of us that, you know, that go to the meetings and some will speak, some will not. They don't, I'll take one for the team <laughs> because I really, we, we all deserve that raise. We're all getting old. We're all going along that where we're getting older and we're going to need that care and we need good providers. Now, how are we going to keep good providers? Honest, um, ones that don't abuse the clients, we need to pay our workers what we deserve. You know, we need that wage increase. Dollars won't make, make us any richer, but it does help us. Um, like I said, I go from one job to another. I have to collect hands when I come home from those jobs. Now, you can tell me if I deserve that dollar raise along with my other coworkers. Having to collect hands when I come home from the work, you know, caring for elderly and then come home. So, um, just wanted to see if also the husband works if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. That concludes public Okay, uh, that concludes uh, public comment. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, we will now move on and take up our consent calendar really quick before we get to our 9.30 timed item. Um, we have item, oh, I hate when my mouse does that, um, have item 12 that is going to be pulled and brought back at a later date. Are there any additional items that members of the board would like to have pulled for separate consideration or comment? Supervisor Crocker? Uh, seven pulled uh, for separate action. Okay, item seven will be pulled for uh, separate action. Uh, are there any additional uh, items for separate consideration? Seeing none, Chair, I'll entertain a motion. Move approval for the remainder of the consent calendar. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor Shuckley and second by Supervisor Valero. Please vote. Motion passes 5-0 unanimous. Uh, we will now take up item seven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just looking for a little bit of background um, on this letter of uh, support and this piece of legislation. Good morning, board and CAO and county council. Um, for this letter, the summary of this basically puts a little bit more of the onus on translating materials that Cal OSHA is already giving out to agricultural employers and workers to be translated into Spanish um, so that the onus is not so much or the burden it's not so much on the county or um, on the cities or on uh, employers or employees. Um, so that is the main driver of this um, Agricultural Workplace Health and Safety Act. There are some other pieces that go along with that um, that are um, pushing Cal OSHA to do a little bit more implementation of some of the guidances that they are themselves putting out there as well. So was this department driven um, based on helping and reducing workload um, from county staff? Um, not necessarily from county staff. This um, was something that we talked about um, with our lobbyist and just kind of felt that it was an overall um, push to, again, put some more of that burden on Cal OSHA versus um, general counties and cities. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, Chair, I'll change the motion. Yeah, if there's no other questions or comments, I'm happy to move to approve. Second. Motion by Supervisor Crocker, second by Supervisor Shuckley, and please vote. 
motion passes unanimously. We will now move on and take up item four, which is a public hearing. I will open the public hearing. It's a request from the Resource Management Agency to adopt the Planning Commission's recommendations and finding of approval and approve tentative subdivision map number TSM 20-002 to subdivide 10.04 acres into eight parcels that range in size from, okay, you can go <laughs> ahead. Yes, uh, Chairman. Uh, supervisors, CAO, Council, I am Aaron Bach. I'm the Assistant Director for the Resource Management Agency. And before you today is tentative subdivision map for uh, SME Homes. And uh, SME and their engineer Weber are present if there are any questions. So on July 8th, 2020, the Planning Commission adopted resolution number 9747, recommending that the board approve a categorical exemption and conditionally approve TSM 20-002. Everything okay? Go, go, go ahead and just call pause if you don't mind. We have to wait for uh, board members to come back. I can't, can't leave during a public hearing. So I'll call pause. Yep, we're just going to call a quick pause until uh, we have our board members return. I was doing such a good job, too. Yeah, you were. <laughs> you were. You started reading some of the stuff that I had to stop reading, so thank you. We had to stop. Board members can't leave during a uh, public hearing. Oh. <laughs> I'll keep it more interesting next next time. Yeah, it, you know, <laughs> that's probably why we lost one was just because he was tired. <laughs> Youngest one on the board. Shouldn't get up and leave. Yeah. No. Right. Why? Well, I, I clear, clearly I didn't say you're the youngest on the board. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, please continue, Aaron. All right, thank you. Uh, TSM 20-002 proposes to subdivide 10.04 acres into eight parcels that range in size from 49,000 to 52,776 square feet, located in the rural residential 43,000 square foot minimum zone. Um, an exception has been requested from the requirement to install curbs and gutters. An exception has also been requested to exceed the 660 foot maximum length of a cul-de-sac in non-mountainous areas and a final map will be required for this project. The vicinity map shows the site is located approximately 634 feet north of Linda Vista Avenue and approximately 700 feet east of Dillon Court, north of the city of Porterville. Uh, consultation was presented to the County Public Works Engineering Branch, uh, Assessor, Environmental Health Services Division, Fire Department, the City of Porterville, and Caltrans. And we have uh, re received responses from all of them. 
Uh, the site is approximately 10.04 acres in size, it's vacant and level, and is not under current cultivation. This project is consistent with the general planning zoning. Uh, it's consistent with PF 4-19 for new development within a city's urban area boundary, and that's why this project is before you today. If it was in the urban development boundary, it would have stayed with the Planning Commission. Uh, it would be a subject to adopted plan lines and setback standards where small, standalone, non-urban projects are proposed. You apply the city, utility, and street master plan setbacks. Therefore, the project is not a standalone, non-urban project, and the county is required to apply the city standards because it's eight lots and not four. Um, <clears throat> and designations, if the city wanted to provide water, but they can't, since it does not, they do not want to annex this project. Uh, the city said they would not stand in the way of the project either. So it is also consistent with the zoning. The subject site is zoned RA43. The rural residential zone is intended for one family dwellings of permanent character, growing and harvesting of field crops and the raising of farm animals. So very uh, broad uh, zoning is applied to this property. Here you can see the zoning map. You can see how far away the city of Porterville, so it'd be quite an effort at this point to annex the property. You can see the project site. It was intended for development. As you can see, the cul-de-sac was brought in to the site at an earlier stage. Here's the map itself. You can see the extension of the cul-de-sac backwards and hence asking for greater than 660 feet. <clears throat> so, with that, that concludes my presentation. Uh, if there's any questions for me or the applicant or their agent, they are available. Are there any questions from uh, members of the board? Okay, this is a public hearing. I will now uh, open it up for public comment. Is there anyone here wishing to comment on this item? We do not have any calls either. We, no calls. Uh, coming forward, Mr. Weber. Uh, Fred couldn't help himself. <laughs> right along with poking sticks in my eye. Uh, Fred Weber, Forrester Weber and Associates, 1620 West Mineral King. Um, here to answer any questions you might have, uh, let you know the street will be built to county standards. Water and septic will be on each lot individually. Those were questions that came up at the uh, Planning Commission. Okay, great. Any further questions? All right, and no further questions. I will close the public hearing. There's no phone comment. Bring it back to the board for action. Motion by Supervisor Townsend, a second by Supervisor Valero. Please vote. Motion passes 5-0 unanimous. Thank you for that presentation. And don't go too far, uh, Aaron, you're up next. Uh, item five is a public hearing. I will open the public hearing at this time. A request from the Resource Management Agency to adopt and certify the addendum to the Tulare County General Plan. Very good. Uh, thank you, Chairman, Supervisors, uh, CAO, Council. Again, I am Aaron Bach. I'm the Assistant Director with the Resource Management Agency. And uh, before you today is General Plan Amendment number GPA 20-003. It is to implement the 2020 Transportation and Circulation Element Amendment, uh, which includes a complete streets policy and vehicle miles traveled guidelines, which is SB 743 implementation. So it's one General Plan Amendment, and it has an uh, associated addendum to the EIR of findings of consistency, which I'll discuss later. Uh, complete Streets policy will build on existing community Complete Streets plans and active transportation plan for the county. It will formalize the existing and future Complete Streets framework through inclusion in the Tulare County General Plan transportation and circulation element, thereby implementing mitigation for nexus purposes. Uh, vehicle miles traveled, as most of you are aware, um, we are, we actually studied vehicle miles traveled in the 2018 Climate Action Plan, so there are no new effects from us doing this um, GPA now. It would establish Tulare County's vehicle miles traveled guidelines consistent with, with the 2018 cap and general plan for the implementation of Senate Bill 743. 
and it achieves the CEQA purposes in the unincorporated area of Tulare County, replacing level of service for CEQA purposes, but allowing us to still use LOS, level of service for safety and efficiency purposes. So it does not replace LOS entirely for our um, um, mitigation purposes. Uh, complete streets policies, it is expected that these policies will benefit community planning areas for the following reasons. It will help guide design and development of multimodal transportation system. It will provide emphasis on safe and convenient pedestrian access. It will ensure the provisions of adequate off-street parking. It will provide a transportation system that is integrated with the region. It will encourage the use of public transit services to reduce reliance on the automobile. It will support efficient goods movements and truck traffic and provide safe and convenient facilities for non-motorized modes of transportation. That will enhance the future livability and character of the unincorporated communities. So our complete streets policies. The current general plan transportation and circulation element includes policies that support a balanced multimodal transportation network, including policies that support the development of bicycle and pedestrian facilities but does not specifically include the term complete streets. So back in 2012, right in 2011, they created the statewide complete streets policies, but because we were in, in the midst of uh, potential litigation with so many different uh, folks, we decided to uh, kick the can down the road on the policy name itself so we wouldn't have to update our uh, general plan EIR, but it's time now. We've done most of our work through the community plans themselves with 18 complete streets policies, and uh, the proposed complete streets policy will build on the existing adopted com complete streets plans and formalize the existing and future complete streets networks and ATP pl plans through inclusion in the Tulare County general plan transportation and circulation element. So the first part of this is really creating the background for the nexus, because the VMT is going to create the impacts, so we have to mitigate. So complete streets will create the mitigation. VMT uh, developed to, to meet the requirements of CEQA, including the new SB 743 regulations that were adopted by the state in December of 2018 and went into effect July 1st, 2020. This will help the county develop transportation improvements that will benefit Tulare County residents and facilitate travel by walking, bicycling, and transit. Establish a framework for analysis and mitigation of VMT impacts in a way that is feasible, non-limiting, and within the scale of land development projects in Tulare County. This sets a goal of reducing VMT uh, throughout the county, thereby improving air quality and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and helps to improve the circulation and transit system within the county Including, including laying the groundwork for the construction of key projects such as safe routes to schools, complete streets, and bike lanes, pedestrian paths. Uh, furthermore, VMT key points. Uh, vehicle miles traveled refers to the amount and distance of automobile travel attributed to a project. The term automobile obviously refers to an on-road passenger vehicle, specifically cars and light trucks. OPR recommends the use of VMT per capita and VMT per employee, significant thresholds to reduce impacts to levels that are below the appropriate averages. OPR recommends determining the project VMT per capita or VMT per employee and comparing it to regional and or citywide averages, which you will see we have done. It is important to note that VMT analysis as described in these guidelines only applies to passengers Passenger travel and not good movement. I want to underline that point. This does not apply to goods movement. Trips are related to the movement of goods for agriculture or industrial purposes would not be subject to a VMT analysis and would be considered to have less than significant impact on the transportation system. So our VMT significance thresholds uh, for land development projects for residential projects, a significant transportation impact occurs if the project VMT per capita equals or exceeds the average VMT per capita for the traffic analysis zone. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on that in a second. 
Uh, office projects, uh, significant impact would occur if VMT per employee equals or exceeds the average VMT per employee for the TAZ. Uh, they said for regional retail projects, a significant uh, impact occurs if the project results in a net increase in VMT, period. And for industrial projects, a significant transportation impact occurs if the project VMT per employee exceeds the average VMT per employee for the TAZ. So this is uh, simplified in this uh, chart here. And uh, you can see it's a fairly easy uh, analysis. We don't want to make this too difficult for folks. We don't want, uh, we, at the same time, we don't want 20 different variations of what we are doing here, like we get with AB 32. So we've simplified it. And in our guidelines themselves, there's three separate analysis folks could use to, to go through this process. As you can see, there's uh, right off the bat, there's the project screening. And if you look at the note at the bottom, VMT impacts presumed to be less than significant for certain projects, including local serving retail projects, other local serving projects, and affordable housing projects. You also see that there are certain, only certain roadways would actually, actually have to do a VMT analysis, and those are ones that are not currently in our general plan, or considered in our general plan. So what is the uh, basis for our 500 uh, trip threshold, uh, average daily trips? Um, mostly those come from air quality analysis backgrounds. It's found also in our climate action plan. You can see Fresno uses a similar 500 ADT, as did uh, San Diego. And really, it, it really comes from the greenhouse gas emission thresholds. Um, as you could see, uh, ITE, um, the uh, engineers figure there's about 10 trips per dwelling, 10 ADT per dwelling. So that's how we get to our first number 10. Um, and you multiply that by the amount of units. Uh, that's the basic minimum thresholds for a lot of the air quality analysis, which is 50. And that's how you get to 500 ADT. Uh, that's also found in our general plan and in our climate action plan, uh, Appendix J of the uh, Climate Action Plan gives us mitigation measures uh, for uh, projects that ha exceed the thresholds for GHG emissions because they're 50 units or more. And most of those mitigation measures already in our Climate Action Plan it obviously include bicycle lanes and uh, pedestrian paths and uh, uh, other active transportation projects. So that's already in our general plan. Here's the traffic analysis zones for the county. Um, obviously, it's, they're pretty big in certain areas, but you can see on the spreadsheet to the side, um, we, we already have the numbers for uh, per capita VMT. Uh, it's all TCAG generates these numbers. This is what they use for the RTIP, so it ties in nicely with the blueprint for the county. And if they exceed these numbers, in addition to exceeding the 580 T threshold, then they would have to do some form of mitigation. So what is the mitigation? The preferred method of VMT mitigation in Tulare County is for projects to provide transportation improvements that facilitate travel by walking, bicycle, or transit uh, that can be accomplished as follows. Uh, performing walking, uh, bicycling, transit facility needs survey, uh, usually about a half mile, but uh, we'll be flexible on that and include upwards of probably a mile or more. Uh, they consult the county adopted plans for potential projects that could be used for VMT. We have a list of all the ATP projects in the guidelines themselves to pick from. Uh, the cost of mitigation provided should not exceed either $20 per average daily trip generated by the project or 0.5% of the total construction cost. If a project provides mitigation that meets either or both of the VMT mitigation costs described above, it could presume a reduction in VMT for reporting purposes. The goal of the mitigation is that it will be sufficient to reduce a project's VMT impacts to a level of insignificance, which we calculate to be about 1% reduction. <clears throat> Here's a list of the ATP projects, and we have quite a list we've developed over the years. So there's projects pretty much in every community. 
I did want to make the point as well that, um, you know, mostly we're looking at, you know, $20 per trip. So if you exceed the threshold at 500 and one, you're probably looking at about $10,000. Um, and I've had some conversations with developers, uh, including uh, Mr. Nunley yesterday, who didn't seem to be too put off by the, the, the numbers we're putting out there. But they could also get credits for sidewalks and bicycle lanes immediately outside of the, the project. So um, a lot of this stuff's gonna be self-mitigated right, right off the bat. Uh, as far as level of service, we're gonna continue to use level of service as we still need to for two other uh, SQL questions. Um, and so they still require the volumetric analysis. Um, it is therefore recommended to you that we keep the adopted level of service standards that they remain in effect and are retained for roadway operational analysis and the project approval process. Um, and that's keeping the existing uh, level of service D in the general plan with a 100 peak hour trip threshold before you need to do a traffic analysis. Um, one thing that does happen quite often actually is even if we mitigate to put in signals or stop signs. The warrant studies themselves say we can't meet the warrant, so we don't end up doing those mitigations for a long time. What we'll also be offering here is in lieu of ever having to build that mitigation themselves, they would contribute into a, a fair share program to also uh, commit monies to ATP projects. Um, <clears throat> and we would look more favor well, we'd be looked upon more favorably by the state and for our ATP projects if we have a trust fund account made for these projects. So we have our match built in right off the bat. Um, if VMT mitigation, and this is the catch-all here, if VMT mitigation becomes infeasible, a sta statement of overriding consideration would be appropriate and approved by the Board of Supervisors. So this project, this general plan amendment is consistent with CEQA. Um, we did an addendum environmental impact report. Uh, the adoption of the complete streets policy and VMT guidelines would not result in any new or substantially greater significant environmental effects. And a program EIR can be used in compliance with CEQA to address the effects of a subsequent activities so long as the activities within the scope of the project, transportation and circulation, and no new effects are found and no new mitigation measures would be required because the existing circulation policies were already in the general plan. So that completes uh, staff's report. I believe our consultant, Eric Rohr from VRPA, one of the top uh, transportation experts in the state assisted with us. I'd like to thank uh, Hector Guerra for really helping pull it together. Um, and uh, of course, Dave Bryant for really pushing through on the getting this general plan amendment language changed. So, was this your last uh, act for uh, Dave to take care of before he retired? Yeah, we, we won't let him go unless he did. So, <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> uh, any questions or comments from board members? Uh, Supervisor Crocker. Um, so, just for clarification, we um, this will not be retroactive to any projects that have already been submitted. No, it would not. Uh, just moving forward, and this is a state mandate that we approve this. Uh, correct. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? This is a public hearing. Are there any uh, members of the public who would like to comment at this time? No phone comments. Any phone comments? No phone comments. Uh, seeing none, I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for discussion and or action. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor Townsend, a second by Supervisor Shucklin. Please vote. Motion passes 5-0 unanimously. Very yes. convincing presentation, Aaron. Thank you. First uh, county in the state of California. Great work. All right. Next, we'll move on and take up item 27, since we already took up item 26. Uh, item 27 is a request from the County Administrative Office to establish an ad hoc retirement committee comprised of two members of the Board of Supervisors to assist the county with evaluating the performance and financial impacts of assumption rate changes to the county's retirement system. Mr. CAO. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Jason Britt, County Administrative Officer. Um, the item before you today is um, a request for the for this board to appoint two members to an ad hoc committee uh, to meet with the Tessera um, Retirement Board ad hoc committee. This is a request from the Retirement Board. Um, there are a number of economic and demographic um, changes occurring in the plan, and um, this gives opportunity for uh, both the Tessera Board Ad Hoc Committee and the Board of Supervisors Ad Hoc Committee to talk about what some of those um, those uh, impacts may be. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Supervisor Shuckling? I don't have any questions. Oh, I, you I was, I mean, Go I'll ahead. make a motion when it's appropriate. I don't okay, know if any, any questions. Uh, uh, questions or comments from uh, board members? I know this is something that uh, I'm very interested in uh, as the board's uh, delegate on the retirement board, and I will not be participating from the retirement board uh, committee's ad hoc perspective. So, uh, and that was my my line of thinking here. was to to uh, nominate you since you are the representative on Cicera already and have that background, and then um, Supervisor Townsend, would you be interested also? Well, you're closer to, I was going to say, you're, you're closer to retirement than I am, not by much. So that, that would be my motion is um, Chairman Vanderpool and Supervisor Townsend. All right, we have a motion uh, and a second. Um, motion by Supervisor Shuckley and a second by uh, Supervisor Townsend. I am sorry, by Supervisor Valero. Sorry, I, I, Townsend's on the committee. All right, please vote. Motion passes 5-0 unanimously. We will now move on and take up item 28, which is a request to receive a presentation from the General Services Agency regarding the projects completed in fiscal year 2019-2020 and the proposed capital improvement plan for fiscal years 2020-21 to 2024-25. Daniel. Hi. Daniel Richardson, your General Services Agency Director here with uh, Brooke Sisk, your assistant GSA director. Together we'll present to you the uh, capital improvement plan. Thank you, chair, members of the board, CAO and county council. Uh, this is one of the most important uh, policy documents that the board adopts each fiscal year. It reflects the county's priorities and it invests in the county's future, be it physical facilities or new buildings. Uh, today we'll uh, give a background and the purpose of the capital improvement plans. Ms. Sisk will then uh, review last year's slate of projects. I'll then provide an overview of the proposed five-year capital improvement plan, followed by some final thoughts and a recommendation for your board. So this aligns the annual operating budget with a long-term capital investment plan. This is a planning document with a set project evaluation process. It allocates limited resources with long-term goals in mind. And if necessary, although not um, foreseen this particular fiscal year, a CIP identifies possible needs for capital financing. Lastly, this is an in a public informational tool with over $50 million in proposed capital spending this current fiscal year. The, uh, the CIP aligns the board's strategic initiatives with investments in infrastructure. For example, in safety and security, we build jails, fire stations. In economic well-being, we have energy efficiency projects. Quality of life, we improve libraries. We make park improvements. And in organizational performance, we have several building remodels proposed. This plan is reviewed by the Space Planning Ad Hoc Committee, which includes two of your board members, the county administrator and the assistant county administrator who provided us with some input. The CIP uses multiple funding sources. <clears throat> this year, 20 million of the $50 million CIP comes from state sources associated with the uh, construction of the Sequoia Field Jail. Other funding comes from county departments, the general fund and the $3.5 million that uh, you received the Millennium Fund presentation earlier today. With that, I'll turn the time over to Brooke Sisk. Thank you. 
Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Mr. Britt, Ms. Peterson. It is still morning, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the following slides show all of the projects, 34 in total, that had expenditures during the last fiscal year, 1920. I'm not going to read the entire list. I will go over some highlights of some of the biggest projects that were completed. But as I quickly go through these slides, let me know if there's any that you have questions about. So it lists each project and its expenditure. So the grand total um, spent in fiscal year 1920 for capital projects was about $9.7 million. So you can see we were very busy last fiscal year and advanced a number of important projects. So now I'm going to highlight the most noteworthy of the projects that were completed or substantially moved forward in fiscal year 1920. First, we have Fire Station 1. I think most, most everyone was at a ribbon cutting several weeks ago. Um, construction on that project, which is adjacent to the Visalia Road Yard, began in March 2019, and it was completed on June 30th, 2020. The facility became operational on July 15th, 2020, and it became operational immediately following that ribbon cutting that day. The new station consists of site improvements, new construction including a crew building with sleeping quarters, kitchen, showers, training room, reception area, storage, and a three bay apparatus building. The project also includes a backup generator to power the facility during a power outage and the total project cost is, was approximately $4.8 million. We do have a small budget for that this, this fiscal year to um, wrap up the change orders and some other outstanding costs for the projects, but it is um, substantially complete at this point. South County Detention Facility construction began on this new 510 bed jail in Porterville in April 2016 and was completed on June 28, 2019. The facility is a two-story structure with tiered housing units and became operational in September 2019. The facility also includes support services for food, laundry, medical, video visitation, storage, administration, and program space. The total project cost approximately $72 million, and $60 million of that was funded by State Assembly Bill 900. In March 2019, IT consolidated the majority of their staff in Government Plaza and vacated approximately 5,500 square feet on the ground floor of the Visalia Courthouse. That space was remodeled for use by the District Attorney's Investigations Unit, and that included new carpet, paint, and furniture. The project was completed in April 2020 and cost approximately $330,000. After the adoption of the Parks and Recreation Strategic Business Plan in June 2017, funds are set aside each year in the CIP to expand or improve features within the county's 11 park system. And some of the ways that these funds were used last fiscal year, um, we, we've done a good job of matching donations and grant funds. So um, the organizers for the end of the trail half marathon proposed some improvements to the statue and surrounding area, including lighting, um, electrical, fixing the fountain, resealing and painting the base surrounding the pond, a new shed structure to house the pump. Um, and if you haven't been by there lately, uh, you can park in the little turnout. You don't even have to go into the park. And especially at night with the lighting, it looks so good, especially with the, the blue painted in, in the pond. So that was just a really great opportunity to partner with the public to make some very visible improvements at Mooney Grove. Also, um, the electrical system at Balch was replaced and upgraded from above ground to underground wiring which um, in the forest setting is much safer. And um, our staff did a lot of the work on that and we used funds from this to pay for a lot of the materials. We also purchased a skid steer to replace an older piece of equipment in the park's fleet and remain in compliance with emission standards set by the California Air Resources Board. 
The new Three Rivers restroom is adjacent to the historical museum and is accessible from Highway 198. The new structure consists of a men's, women's, and unisex bathroom, fixtures, and path of travel to two new ADA parking spaces. The project's, project also consists of site improvements and new construction, including building, plumbing, septic, electrical, and a new Southern California Edison service connection. Construction on this project began in August 2019. It's in the final stages, um, and we hope it will be complete this month or early next month. The total cost of the project will be approximately $500,000, and we expect minimal expenses on that project this fiscal year as it's practically done. Board Chambers technology upgrades. So um, construction on this project began in March 2019 to upgrading upgrade the aging audiovisual, multimedia, and room control system within the board chambers where we are right now. And that project resulted in high quality, high definition, state of the art system to facilitate and document these meetings, voting records, and presentations. It was completed in October 2019 and cost approximately $450,000. In April 2019, the board approved a policy for public art um, and also established an art selection committee to review and select art pieces to display in county-owned facilities. In September 2019, the committee coordinated solicitation selection and temporary display of artwork in the lobby of Government Plaza Building in Visalia. And we have an annual allocation established for public art now each year in the capital improvement plan of $50,000. So that will allow us to do projects like these. Museum projects. In September 2019, your board adopted the Tulare County Museum Strategic Business Plan. And that included dedicated funding to be set aside each year in the CIP. So we'll be having an annual allocation of $50,000 to um, expand and make improvements at the museum. In fiscal year 1920, the funds were used to install new security cameras, glass display cases, make repairs to the roof over the gun room, and hire a local artist, Jana Botkin, to paint murals on the exterior of the main entrance. So you can see in the pictures here, those are our pictures of those um, lovely murals that really have just made a world of difference on the exterior of the main museum building. Um, two other notable projects that are not pictured in this slideshow, but worth mentioning, are the new vocational education building and the, and the law library. So the Voc Ed building construction began in November 2019 for a new 2,920 square foot building. And that consists of classrooms, large shop areas, secure storage, bathrooms, utility closet, roll up doors, and an outdoor covered work area. That project was completed in August 2019 and cost approximately one and a half million dollars. And the law library, I believe Supervisor Valero shared pictures of that at a recent meeting. That is on the ground floor of the courthouse and it was upgraded with new carpet, paint, electrical improvements. That was completed in May 2020 and cost approximately $30,000. So unless there are any questions about the projects that have been completed, I'll turn it back over to Daniel, who's gonna talk about our plan for the upcoming fiscal year. Any questions or comments uh, related to the completed projects? Okay. Okay, Please thank continue. you. Thank you, Brooke. Okay, let me highlight a few projects on each slide, but if you have questions on those that I'm not mentioning, feel free to bring them up. Um, just to, there are some categories here. I'll just explain the annual allocations. Uh, this category pays for small projects involving HVAC, roof, electrical, plumbing, paving, ADA, and public art. Things that just come up during the year, things break. We need to be able to fix them. Um, the Sequoia Field Program Facility will hopefully start this year, um, and so that uh, we have $20 million included in this fiscal year's uh, budget. We have the emergency dispatch relocation that's uh, Right now, um, the plans are about complete, the review is complete, and hopefully we'll bring to you uh, approval of, of bids at some point. We're estimating the project cost of 2.1 million. Also, we have remodeled the Terrabella Fire Station, uh, $1.7 million. Uh, not included, inadvertently left out of this table, but it is in, in the report, is the Porterville substation relocation. There's $225,000 in the current fiscal year 
for this uh, design and construction of a new substation that's closer to the Sheriff's Porterville operations adjacent to the South County Detention Facility. The estimated total project cost would be $2 million, and uh, this, of course, is subject to funding from the, the Thule Tribe. Okay, moving on to the next slide. A uh, number of projects here. We're uh, currently finishing up the former Kmart. We call it Center Drive. That building being, is being remodeled by a contractor. Uh, our cost right now is $4.3 million to install furniture, fixtures, and other equipment. Also, there's a remodel at the, at the youth facility next to the detention facility of $952,000 to repurpose that for a variety of programs. We also have, a, under the Health and Human Services Agency, a new infectious disease clinic, which is being designed, and uh, that uh, total is almost $2.8 million in this, in this CIP. Under the library, we have uh, two uh, library projects, the Dinuba Library model at $2.1 million, and then in Springville, uh, a new library, um, acquisition of property, design, and hopefully con uh, begin construction of that facility. In the other projects category, we have uh, at Government Plaza, hopefully soon we'll see um, going out to bid for a paving project and actually adding new parking out there, 1.6 million. And then in park improvements, uh, the board adopted a, a parks and recreation strategic plan in 2017. And so this line, this line item allows us to expand and improve a number of existing and new features at parks. For example, uh, some of these include at Alpa, we'll use GoodWorks matching funds for new picnic tables and tree planting. At Ledbetter, we have some grant matching funds for new sidewalks and a basketball court. At Mooney Grove, we'll do some pond banking, some sidewalks and arbors. And at Pixley, um, new picnic tables, trash cans, and concrete for the permanent disc golf tee pads. And then at Woodville, some grant matching funds for installation of 300 shade trees and a new irrigation system. So a number of projects spread throughout, throughout the parks. Also, uh, an exciting project uh, we have is a museum uh, at the museum area in an antique ag equipment building. Uh, just over half a million dollars. Um, and then we're, as Brooke mentioned earlier, we're going to complete that Three Rivers restroom. The only thing left on it is electrical. And the last uh, slide under the current uh, CIP, we uh, are putting in a new fence. The Blue Ridge uh, is a security fence around a repeater site. And that is pretty much wrapped up at this point. Um, so the grand total is $50,640,190, with the largest expenditure being for the Sequoia Field Detention Center. So any questions on these projects? OK. You know, real, real quick, Daniel, if you want to go back one, I, I just think it's important to, uh, uh, to highlight that. Um, beginning in 2021, 2022, I noticed the Tulare Acres Professional Center Improvements has uh, an annual allocation of funding. Would you just real quick highlight what the plan is there? Certainly. Yeah, the Tulare Acres, we've had, uh, we're having some, some shift in some of our, our lessees. Where, so we have some renters who are moving out, and so we have some vacant space. And so we're evaluating how we can best use that space for a variety of government uses and private uses, so we may need to invest some money to, uh, to make the space um, ready for a business to move in and make smaller spaces. Right now, we have large swaths of, of vacant, unimproved space, and it's been the recommendation from our local realtor that, that we've hired that um, the businesses are looking for smaller spaces, such as five, four, 3,000 square foot office space, rather than 20,000 square feet. So that's why that investment is you know, showing $2 million, $1 million. We want to try and make those improvements to get us a better return on the county's investment. Thank you. Appreciate that. OK. So next steps. Throughout the year, uh, departments do approach General Services Agency with building needs, which are evaluated and brought to the Space Planning Committee and ultimately to your board for, for direction. We need to evaluate the Visalia Courthouse and its future in light of a study showing the escalating costs of remodeling this building. 
its physical plant is aged. We also have several non-safety public departments currently housed in the Visalia Courthouse. And so part of the analysis is figuring out their long-term future in that location. We also talked about the Tillery Acres building. What's its future going to be and who's gonna go in there? Um, so this CAP prioritizes fire stations, sheriff substations, library remodels, and a variety of, of other projects as, as we've gone through. Um, I need to acknowledge uh, many who have contributed to preparing the CIP. We have an excellent capital projects team. I want to give credit to Dennis Lehman, our beloved retired manager. Mm -hmm. um, he, he's been marvelous over the, over the many years that he's given to the county. We, we now enjoy, continue to enjoy the services of Kyle Taylor, Mark Van Fossen, and, and Victor Calderon. Um, also, we have a great administration staff and, and Tina Harmon and Allison Pierce. And I also want to give a lot of credit to Brooke Sisk, who, who's taken on a significant role in preparing the, the CIP. Um, GSC understands the importance and the stewardship of properly spending county funds contained in this CIP. We are humbled and we thank you for your trust in the GSA capital team. With that, um, today's action, we ask the board that you approve the capital improvement plan and authorize the, uh, the drawdown of the $3.5 million from the Tulare County Millennium Fund Program pursuant to the Tulare County Financing, Tulare County Public Financing Authority Agreement number PFA-03. Okay, uh, do we have any questions or comments from board members? Supervisor Crocker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the uh, report. Daniel and Brooke, always, uh, very fascinating to see all the work that's going on and, and what we've got planned in the future. Um, I think as far as the as far as the, the five year plan, that's where most of my questions or comments are regarding mo looking forward are. Um, it seems to be there was a lot of shifts of dollars, so dollars that were allocated and programmed last year and last year's five year CIP. Um, and last year's fiscal year have now been shifted to this year, um, which tells me that they weren't completed. Um, was there systematic issues or are we, are we having capacity issues as far as getting projects complete or were there other factors? What were some of the reasons I can name off some of the ones that were, that were, uh, that were allocated funds last year but, but have now shifted to this fiscal year? Yeah, there definitely is a rollover. We, for example, we know um, that some projects are multi-year projects. We acknowledge that jails take multiple years from planning to from start to completion. And that did happen with some of them. For example, right now, we have the Sequoia Field um, Program Facility, which we've been waiting on having the, uh, the ground lease meeting with the state due to COVID, they've been delaying it. And so that project will likely now last through probably the next two or three years, you'll see it continued in, in this plan. Um, you know, we, we always have park improvements, the government plaza parking and paving, the design started, you know, last fiscal year has moved into this fiscal year. Um, many times we put the whole project in one fiscal year knowing we we're just gonna get at the planning, and yet we know the construction will take place the next fiscal year. So that, I know it doesn't answer all of your question, but I think we have good capacity, we have a good team, um, sometimes we, we have a habit of putting everything, the costs, in one, and then as we move through the plans, to bids, to construction, and final punch list, it just takes time. And I, I guess I understand that, and that I, that's helpful that stating that um, most of the projects were just placed in one fiscal year, but that's not the case for all projects. So if we look at the you know, Rossi Library remodel, that's phased over two fiscal years. Um, same with former Porterville Courthouse remodel, county administrative office. So I guess, um, I, and, I, and I don't bring it up to say that I have a preference one, well, I guess, you know, seeing the numbers more in time, and I know in the past uh, jail facilities, we have spread those out. Um, just knowing kind of, are they multi-year projects or um, are we anticipating that completion will happen in 2021 or is it, you know, are there going to be lingering costs where we're still, you know, it's a three-year project, so spread the costs over three years. So that's, that's one comment. Um, 
that I'd, li I'd like to see probably prospectively looking at that as far as more of, you know, so that we, we see funding that matches as far as what the time frame of the, of the projects are going to be. Um, and then I think would also be helpful is um, comparing that to past uh, capital improvement project uh, plans. Um, so that we're looking at, you know, are we kind of following along with what we approved last year or the previous year? You know, I mean, I granted, I don't expect that we go back, you know, years and years and years, but having some, some relation to what we've already approved and, and seeing that, you know, there's no longer a need for that facility or that's no longer a high priority. We have this other high priority because of X, Y, Z and why, why things fall off, why things come back on. Um, because I do know that there are some, um, there are some, new, um, some new projects on there. Um, and I think there, it, it seems worthwhile without knowing all the details. I mean, the infectious disease clinic, I don't think that requires a whole lot of um, explanation to understand why there would be a need for that today versus, you know, last year, we wouldn't have needed to, you know, that wouldn't have necessarily been on the radar or something that we would have um, been pushing for. So um, the, that'd be um, a couple of comments. And then the one, uh, the other, other question um, that you, and you kind of briefly mentioned it in regards to the Portville substation uh, move. Um, tribe, the, the Tule River tribe has agreed to help offset those costs and to pay for that. Um, so from a, from a process standpoint, will the capital improvement um, plan get reimbursed um, for any upfront costs since we're already spending money and, as, and the agreement was three and a half million dollars from the tribe, which is not only gonna cover the Porterville substation, but based on your report, the early March substation as well. Um, so is that going to um, are we going to be reimbursed? Is that internally as far as, um, I, I, how, how is that yeah, going to work? Yeah, I know, I appreciate the question. We will begin these projects when we receive the funds. Okay. We're not fronting funds. It's, it's dependent on them you know, being, being successful in their project and then us receiving the money per the agreement that was signed. Very good. Yeah. And, um, and then the last, um, just, uh, mentioned and I mentioned it earlier in the Millennium Fund. I just think we need to be wise as far as um, how much we're taking out of the Millennium Fund. I think uh, Lauren made an excellent point as far as I'm comfortable with taking out three and a half million this year um, based on what um, what the market conditions are. But um, I can easily foresee a time where um, it probably would not be prudent to pull out the full maximum amount and that we may need to pull out a lesser amount to ensure the stability of that fund. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment quickly about the, fir the first part of your comments. Um, the five-year CIP is more of a planning tool and not a budget. So um, those dollar amounts that are plugged into subsequent years are still subject to change based on the priorities of the board and the things that we talk about at the ad hoc committee. This year's amounts are our budget and we put every amount of funding that we have in, in there, whether we're going to spend that money this fiscal year or not. So it carries over. The capital projects budget rolls over from year to year. So you see, last fiscal year we spent nine million while our budget is 50 million this year. It, it accounts for all of the funding or potential funding that we could receive throughout the year. So hopefully that kind of helps explain that a little bit. It, it does help. I, it's just a little bit, I guess, setting expectations, I guess, from, from my own standpoint, and I think the public standpoint, it's a little bit misleading um, because um, it, it looks like we're planning on completing those projects this fiscal year when really the intent is just to reserve those funds or make sure that we're budgeting for them, recognizing that they're three, four year projects or whatever. I think next year we could, we could state what expected to be completed in that fiscal year, that would be helpful. All right, does that wrap it up, Supervisor? Supervisor Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks, Daniel, for the presentation and Brooke. And, uh, and, and really, I just have a, a comment more than a question. 
um, having been put on the space planning ad hoc, being able to see all of these things going on uh, behind the scenes. Um, I, uh, it's been eye-opening, and, uh, and I really appreciate all the work that, that you and your staff um, put in to put these things together, and especially now uh, with the changing environment that we're in, having to uh, sort of to, to move and shift quickly and to move things around. You mentioned the, uh, the market when you were uh, discussing the Tulare Acres. Um, you mentioned how we're going to have to make some shifts there just because of the way the market's changed because of this whole thing uh, for, uh, for lease space. So uh, I, I do really appreciate all the, the time that you put in and the staff puts in and putting these, uh, these plans and visions together for what we need to do. Thanks a lot. Okay, Supervisor Shuckley. I just <clears throat> want to reiterate again uh, how fortunate we are to have that Millennium Fund, to have those funds to put into projects like this. I also want to make note that they're all very worthy projects. Uh, I just want to note the parks projects. I think it's very important to continue to keep that investment in our parks, especially now as we're seeing parks are the place that people are, are wanting to be and go because of you know being outdoors and activity. So thank you. And I'll, I'll just conclude by saying thank you uh, for a great presentation. Uh, your department is often uh, uh, one that uh, does the work behind the scenes, but it's great to have you here in front of us uh, giving the presentation here today. Um, I think that uh, I, I agree with a lot of the comments that have been made by my colleagues, but I also want to say it is very important that we continue to reinvest in our facilities and we draw upon um, the resources that we have available to us in a fiscally responsible manner so that we can continue to see these facilities serviced into the future. Um, the Tulare Acres uh, Center is a great building that has done very well for the county in terms of generating uh, additional cash flow in recent years. However, we are in different times and changing times. And so investing and reinvesting in the building, especially knowing that those reinvestments are going to be utilizing dollars that have been set aside generated by the building, but are going to be spent on the building in the future to help us continue to see uh, fiscal results from that investment uh, is a very important thing. So I thank you for highlighting that today. Uh, I appreciate the commitment of the board uh, into making sure that that uh, uh, building is continuing to be profitable for the county in the near future, as well as uh, meet our needs as we have space needs like we're seeing right now with uh, the relocation and consolidation um, in location of our dispatch facilities. So thank you very much. Supervisor Crocker. Yeah, just on that note on the Tulare Acres uh, tenant improvement, and I, I absolutely agree with what Supervisor Vanderpool and, um, and others have stated about that and Supervisor Townsend. Um, but just to, just to note that um, last, in last year's CIP, um, you know, staff was looking forward to that and the board as well. And so we did plan on having in next fiscal year a million and a half dollars and the subsequent year a million and a half dollars. So there are um, market conditions that have changed that and maybe expedited some things and expanded the scope. But, um, but staff was already, even in last year's condition, was looking at n recognizing there was a need for um, reinvesting in that space and making sure that we were ready for whatever may come ahead. So uh, kudos to you guys for being advanced thinking and, and recognizing that there's going to be a need. All right. Uh, anything further from board members? Any public comment, Madam Clerk? There are none. Okay. Uh, chair will entertain a motion and action. Have a motion from Supervisor Valero. We have a second by Supervisor Shuckley. And please vote. Motion passes 5-0 unanimously. Thank you for that. We will now move on and take up item 29, which is a section where the board can make a referral to staff to have a matter considered for a future agenda. Are there such requests today? Seeing none, I will look to county council to see if we have need for closed session. Yes, Mr. Chairman, items A through C are off calendar. The remainder of the items will be heard, but I do not expect any announcements out. All right, thank you for that. Appreciate everyone in attendance today and those who are listening uh, online. I hope everyone stays healthy and safe. Meeting adjourned to closed session.